Welcome, friends. Welcome to the Ned Stark Tower of Joy reread. We're hanging with our good buddy Ned once more, and also my good friend Gray Waste Tim of the Gray Waste Tim YouTube channel. Say hello, everyone. And Gray Waste Tim. Sorry, that was confusing. Say hello to everyone, Gray Waste Tim. You at home can also say hi to Tim. Even though he can't hear you, he can hear you. He can hear hello, you. everybody. Thanks for having me over again. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me over again. Oh, hang on. Sure. That's not your hello, fault. Everybody. We got like five hellos there. That was perfect. That was, <laughs> it was very... Everyone is greeted. There's lots of people in the chat, so we needed several hellos. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're doing two chapters. Some of the Game of Thrones chapters are a bit shorter. And George, uh, one of my favorite writing techniques that George uses is that he sometimes continues an idea either a symbolic or thematic idea or both, from one chapter to the next. Sometimes he'll do it across characters. So John dies, for example, at the end of uh, A Dance with Dragons. He gets murdered by, uh, you know, a few Bowen Marsh and a few other, Wick Whittlestick, a few other miscreants. And then the next chapter, you pick up and it's Barristan observing Quentin's death. And there's a lot of linked and paralleled ideas, three days, Jesus symbolism and all various things. Sometimes the ideas are continued across the characters of a chapter. So the Tower of Joy dream that Ned has is a fever dream, as you probably remember. Whoa, spoilers. What did I spoil? Did I spoil something, Tim? Game of Thrones? <laughs> how, could, how can we spoil anything? This is the first book. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, John dies. Yeah, no, he, he dies. It's probably not permanent. So, And there's some people who don't think he's dead. Also, he's just really cold. And bloody and unconscious somewhere in there. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I'm joking, too. We're, we're all joking together. <laughs> so <clears throat> Ned's fever dream chapter, he has the reason why he's having a fever dream. This is right after he got injured in the streets by Jamie Lannister's thugs. His Lannister thugs jumped Ned, killed Jory. And Ned, you know, blacks out. He got his leg broken, I think it was, or speared or something. And then uh, he has that Tower of Joy fever dream. So we're going to read both those chapters. Quentin dies. Yeah, I know, Lucas. I know. I know. <laughs> Shout out to uh, King of the North in the chat. I saw you. And so um, with these two chapters, not only is it interesting because Ned's fight with Jamie has some obvious parallels with the Tower of Joy fight. Uh, there's three against... A greater number three against seven and three against much more than seven um there are some parallels and then of course in terms of symbolism it's really interesting ned ned is we've already identified the last hero scene as somewhat of a or the the tower of joy scene as which you can see uh but the art is by joshua kairos today hello queen persephone welcome to squisher um the Tower of Joy fight seems to be, in terms of symbolism, to be sort of an archetypal retelling of some kind of the last hero versus the others, with Ned and his gray wraiths as Night's Watchmen, the white armored, snow white armored King's Guard as the others. They're guarding a symbolic Night's Queen figure who's Lyanna. She has the blue winter rose crown, which implies her as a as a frozen queen. There's some other stuff, but just take my word for it. Um and then there's baby John Snow. And I got my John Snow shirt on up in the tower. So something, you know, it parallels. If you're new to the channel, there is a theory floating around. It predates me. I've worked on it some. That the, uh, the last hero or the ancient Starks somehow rescued a baby that was supposed to be given to the others. Maybe a baby of knights, king and queen. Much like uh, Gilly and Sam rescue Gilly's baby monster who was supposed to be given to the others. And we know the others want that baby and they're chasing them, right? So that could yeah. be a pattern. Sam is very last hero-ish. Um, he's him and Night's Queen stealing a baby. There's some stuff there. <clears throat> so we're going to look at this. We already know to look at uh, Ned at the Tower of Joy as some kind of last hero action. The thing is, I believe that a lot of that last hero, Knights, King, and Queen stuff might have taken place inside the Weirwood Net, Tim. My favorite word, Weirwood Net. Drink at home. Drink. Weirwood Net. 
And with with the Ned uh, chapters, it's very much like he's having a physical fight versus the others in the physical world, and then lapsing into the dream realm and like continuing his mission. That's kind of how I read it. So we'll look out for that as we read these two chapters. What up from the 916? Hell yeah, nerdo. What's up? That's me. I'm in the 916. So uh, there you go. Those are the kind of the two things we'll be looking at. Parallels between the two fights, just in terms of the story. And then the idea of Ned as a last hero figure, potentially going into the Weirwood Net to finish his fight. I dab every time you say Weirwood Net. We should all do that, comic dog. Praise Garth. So with that said, Tim, uh, are you open to the right chapter? Yes, I am on Eddard 9 right now. Chapter 35. Uh, real quick, let's take uh, 30 to 60 seconds. Uh, what is the last thing that you have done on your channel? Let the people know you have a channel. You're not just a guy that shows up on my channel. You have your own <laughs> channel. You talk about stuff. And your video production quality, in case you haven't watched lately, guys, Going up with every video, intro song, graphics, a little Tim using his theatrical voice skills that he's been buffing up on the Duncan Egg skill. These are good videos. You got to check them out. So tell them what you've been up to. Yes, currently I'm covering the Zothic Legend Cycle by Lynn Carter. Lynn Carter is a author who contributed heavily to the Cthulhu mythos and was a real life friend and editor of George R. R. Martin. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, fortunately, Lynn Carter passed in the early 90s. He wasn't around for when George put Game of Thrones together, but his influence is definitely there. Uh, the last thing I did was his short story, Out of the Ages, where I did a, I did a read aloud of that. Uh, currently going to be covering the rest of that, but I'm currently, I actually have that on hold because I'm taking your advice from last time I was on. And uh, I'm taking a break to focus on House Lofton. I've been writing... Over the weekend, I've been writing a script. So cool. Actually, when we get when we get to uh, the went that sh when jo when Ed fights uh, the Kingsguard, there's a went among them, and I've with this script, I've had to go go back and look at uh, the the lords and houses that have been over Heron Hall, and of course that includes House Went. So uh, the Wents are pretty fre they're pretty fresh in my mind because I'm coming up with as I cover House Lofton and. The true curse of Heron Hall, which is that it makes you house poor. You have to look into all the other families that had it as well and see how long their reign was. There you go. Um, that sounds awesome. I'm glad you took my advice. The the, the Lostin theory is really interesting, and uh, the Went stuff. You know, a lot of people have been poking at it, and there's some interesting ideas there. But I'm not sure. Uh, somebody did. Con okay, so Tim, we we're talking about. Why is Went at Tower of Joy? Somebody was saying, well, he's Batman. And Batman, much like Jon <laughs> Snow, lost his parents when he was young and then grew up to fight crime in, in a black outfit or something like that. There yeah, probably actually, more to it, but yeah. Uh, the, I guess I'm spo I do have a, a Batman joke in my script for Lucas Lofton when he's awarded Heron Hall. He is the first Batman. <laughs> and of course, I have the sound effect from the anime. I have a... A, a quick sound clip from the animators. The da, 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 da. I want to make these as I try and do these produce videos. I got to put my own flavor on them so that give a yeah. sense of like how, of, of my own style. Yeah, Arya actually has more Batman parallels because she actually witnesses the death of uh, her parents. Or yeah, basically yeah, both of her parents separately. But that's a part of the Bruce Wayne story, and. Uh, then she, she literally goes across the sea and gets trained by an assassin's guild. So Arya's, Arya's story is literally Bruce Wayne, Batman, whole thing. But yeah, that could be part of the part of the Went thing. So anyway, yeah, she basically joins the League of Shadows, more or less. Yes, very, very much so. Kindly man, a.k.a. Raz al Ghul. <laughs> well, that does make me wonder if they're if um if the Faceless Men are going to try to hunt Arya and turn against her like League of Shadows does, I actually don't think so. I think they're training her to fight the others and that the Faceless Men are in on on the fight against the others and they're actually helping us. I think the Starry Wisdom cult and Faceless Man cult are good. That's the <laughs> message. <laughs> All righty. Well, let's get it started. I believe this is... 
Oh, eight or nine or something. I'm not sure. Whatever. He found Littlefinger in the brothel's common room, chatting amiably with a tall, elegant woman who wore a feathered gown over skin as black as ink. By the hearth, Heward and a buxom wench were playing at forfeits, which is something like strip poker. From the look of it, he'd lost his belt, his cloak, his mail shirt, and his right boot so far, while the girl had been forced to unbutton her shift to the waist. Jory Cassell stood beside a rain-streaked window with a wry smile on his face, watching Heward turn over tiles and enjoying the view, which imme- immediately makes us wonder, is, is Jory either, is he being like very responsible and being on duty, or does he not care for the delights of women? One has to wonder. Heward obviously mm-hmm. does. But it does say he's enjoying the view, so maybe maybe he's just not partaking. Who knows? Ned paused at the foot of the stair and pulled on his gloves. It's time we took our leave. My business here is done. Heward lurched to his feet, hurriedly gathering up his things. Okay, so is how much dialogue are we going to have? I didn't think about the what characters. I feel gravelly today, so I should be Ned. You want to just start taking all the other characters and see how it sorts out or what? Uh, okay. Uh, There's, yeah, because I'm not. Sh- it's been a while since I've read this one. I'm not sure how many people speak. Yeah, Jamie. Uh, Jamie comes in a bit. Maybe we should just read the characters as we're reading the narrative. Oh, Littlefinger's there too. You want to do Ned, and I'll do Littlefinger, or you want to do Littlefinger? You do smarmy people pretty well, actually. Okay, I'll. T- I guess I'll take Littlefinger. <laughs> yeah. Right. Think about um, Uthor Underleaf without the joy. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. He is from Bravos, <laughs> so he could have a French accent. <laughs> <laughs> I like Smarmy too. Talk Studios, don't sell me short. Rhaegar is all Smarm. Oh, I got some new Rhaegar material for you coming on Tuesday in the Ironborn video. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Tim, we're going to have to do a live stream after the Ironborn video. I had to cut stuff out of there. I couldn't fit. So. Yeah, I had a feeling that was going to be a long one, probably a two or three parter, if you want to cover every every angle. It's going to be a three parter. Part one is an hour and ten minutes. Oof. And I had to cut <laughs> stuff out of that script that I recorded. and was just like, got to go. So, anyway. Big booms happened. Um... My business here is done. Hubert lurched to his feet, hurriedly gathering up his things. As you will, my lord, Jory said. I'll help Will bring round the horses. He strode to the door. Littlefinger took his time saying his farewells. He kissed the black woman's hand, whispered some joke that made her laugh aloud, and sauntered over to, bit, and sauntered over to Ned. Your business, he said lightly, or Robert's. They say the hand dreams, the king's dreams, speaks with the king's voice, and rules with the king's sword. Does that also mean you fuck with the king's... Lord Baelish, Ned interrupted, you presume too much. I'm not ungrateful for your help. It might have taken us years to find this brothel without you. That does not mean I intend to endure your mockery, and I'm no longer the king's hand. The dire wolf must be a prickly beast, said Littlefinger with a sharp twist of his mouth. A warm rain was pelting down from a starless black sky as they walked to the stables. Ned drew up the hood of his cloak. Jory brought out his horse. Young Will came right behind him, leading Littlefinger's mare with one hand, while the other fumbled with his belt and the lacings of his trousers. A barefoot whore leaned out of the stable door, giggling at him. Will we be going back to the castle now, my lord? Jory asked. Ned nodded and swung into the saddle. Littlefinger mounted up beside him. Jory and the others followed. Uh, how do we... How do you say that name? Sh- Shataya? Shataya, I think, yeah. yeah. Some people say Shataya, Chitaya, but I think Shataya sounds cool or whatever it means. Shataya. Shataya runs a choice establishment, Littlefinger said as they rode. I have half a mind to buy it. Brothels are a much sounder investment than ships I've found. Whores seldom sink, and when they are boarded by pirates, why, the pirates pay good coin like everyone else. Lord Peter chuckled at his own wit. 
That's so this is um I want to pause for good writing here. This is a funny joke. Like let's be real, it's funny. Um especially that when they're boarded by pirates the pirates pay a good coin. It's like kind of funny, but it's a little too cute because he's joking about exploitation and you yeah. know things like that. So right. and it's the kind of thing that like Ned doesn't laugh a lot anyway. This is the last kind of joke that Ned's going to find funny. Um, yeah. And Littlefinger, that's the troll. Is that Littlefinger loves to troll Ned. This is Littlefinger's revenge. It's not just the betrayal. It's all of these moments where Littlefinger is tweaking Ned's nose and making him uncomfortable, telling jokes that he knows Ned won't find funny, and then laughing at him. Like, ha, 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 ha. Like, just make sure you, you catch that extremely trollish nature because Peter has been building up this grudge for years, years <laughs> against all the Starks, really against Brandon. But Ned is, you know, serves as an easy proxy for him. So <laughs> but the thing is, he's, he says horse seldom sink, but they go down all the time. Think about it. <laughs> but Damn. It's Fired. You're fired. <laughs> Hopefully everybody goes down all the time. <laughs> Ned let him prattle on. After a time, he quieted it and they rode in silence. The streets of King's Landing were dark and deserted. The rain had driven everyone under their roofs. It beat down on Ned's head, warm as blood and relentless as old gilts. Fat drops of water ran down his face. Okay, so in terms of symbolism going, um, you know, a Game of Thrones, the symbolism is pretty good. It's about 70 to 80% there. Most of the symbolism that we're going to find throughout all five books is here in a Game of Thrones to some extent. It usually just gets fleshed out a bunch. Um, the Reign of Blood is a good example. Like, it's... The thing that comes from the moon is a shower of bleeding stars. So it's a bloody shower, meteor shower, rain of blood, all that stuff. There's a Valerian steel sword called Red Rain, which is all the Valerian steel swords basically have moon meteor nicknames because the idea of a black dragon sword is just a symbol for a black meteor that looks like a fiery dragon as it burns down through the atmosphere, right? So Red Rain, a storm of swords, exactly. Same concept. Uh, when Sander and Arya pull up to the Trident, maybe it's the Red Fork, or I forget which fork it is, um, the rain is pricking the river like 10,000 swords. And that is your storm of swords. Also, um, Waymar, when his sword shatters, it's a rain of needles. Arya's sword is named Needle. So it's this kind of body of similar phraseology that's like a rain of swords a rain of bleeding stars red rain is a part of that and we're going to see red rain called out later that's why i'm mentioning it so here it's is this beginning of the symbolism the rain is beating down on ned's head warm as blood and relentless as old guilt so it's a blood rain it's a, a shower of blood that's mm -hmm. that's a long night symbolism is beginning essentially but because martin is a skilled writer it's tied to the themes of the chapter and Ned's internal conflict. So it's, the rain is blood. It's reminding him of the blood that was shed. Like old guilts, he's thinking about people that died, that he couldn't save. Like we were talking about this. I was talking about this with my uh, manager, Maynard James Plum. What does Ned feel guilty about? He didn't really do anything wrong that we know of. We still don't know the full story, but he seems to have acted honorably. The Danes named... Edric Dane after Ned, so he didn't offend the Danes. What does he feel guilty about? Well, probably he wasn't able to save his sister. He wasn't able to stop Brandon from being rash. He wasn't in King's Landing when his father and brother died. That's the best answer I got. What do you think? What do you think the guilts are, Tim? Uh, the guilts are knowing. I'm guessing, like once it comes from after he finds out the truth when he reaches the Tower of Joy that uh, Liana hadn't been kidnapped, that she willingly wrote, that she w willingly rode off with Rhaegar. And 
I think it is knowing that when we get to this idea of Robert's rebellion being built on a lie. Now that's kind you're right. of oh, to you're an right. Extent. He never cleared that up. I never even occurred he to me. Yeah, he never he let Rhaegar be remembered as a abductee and a rapist when he really wasn't. Mm-hmm. And he lied to Robert also, his friend. Yeah. And he had lied to Catelyn as well. Sorry, go ahead. It's, it, well, it's it's lying in the sense that he didn't speak up. Like he didn't he didn't so much lie as he didn't say anything. He like kept it with him and kept it quiet. But I guess, but in a way that is uh, just as much. Even though you're not saying false words, not saying anything can still lend credence to a lie because you're allowing that belief to spread. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And Brandon was a complete Chad. 100%. <laughs> that's, that's, that's confirmed. Yeah. Well, uh, so, so, okay. Like we so, said last week, though, is that Robert's rebellion might have been built on a lie, but something was going to happen because the Mad King's downfall was death, was inevitable. It was just a course of who was going to be the one to to do it. And like we had said last time, best result would have been a bloodless coup where Rhaegar kind of overthrew him and just kind of got maybe got him to uh, abdicate and let him and go and just live a quiet retiree life but something like the the idea that the Robert Rebellion is built on a lie like I said is it's kind of half true because no matter what something was always going to happen it just we just don't know what those actions would have been but something had to have been done with Eris like there's no changing that yeah, so this seems like a combination of survivor's guilt and some of the things he had to do to sort of clean everything up and create peace. Not unlike lying about, at the end, to try to save Sansa's life. He lied about, you know, betraying Robert. So it's kind of like he's this honorable guy, but he's forced to say things that aren't true, like for the greater good. Which honestly, again, shows you that Ned's virtue is real. It's not a fake honor. Oh, my reputation. Like... He's really thinking about the greater good, how many people's lives will be affected by his decisions. And that is very admirable, um, I will again say. Uh, Kirsty Angel with a good comment mentioned the reigns of Castamir as another example of the blood reign or the red reign symbol. Mm. Because, of course, um, the reigns were, they had a red lion and they were all drowned in the mines. Um, I was thinking about that drowning in the mines thing. I reread the passage, Tim, and this just time out for Weirwood Net, just a couple minutes here. When Tywin flooded those mines, it said, there was not a big enough opening even for a squirrel to escape, but the water found its way in there. So think about this. The, 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 uh, the, the Lannisters are the golden lions on red, and the, the cast, the, uh, the, is the reins, yeah, the reins and Tarbex are the ones who were killed. So the reins are the red lion on gold, an inverse of the Lannister sigil. So it's very much depicted as a, in, a sibling rivalry of a sort. And one, one group drowns the others in the, in the cave. And the squirrels couldn't escape. You follow me? So, like, this is about the half of the green men or children of the forest who were killed or trapped in the weirwood net or something like that, like drowned in the green sea, but in, in caves, just like the children live in caves. And then the yeah. squirrel thing is like the big clue there. So I, I want to go back for- into that, but I think there is some interesting symbolism there about a bifurcation in the weirwood net and the death of children of the forest that is definitely being spelled out. And also they're, they're all cat people like the children because they're, they're lions, you know. Yeah. So. And something we've talked about a lot is George's influence from not just other writers, but also music that he likes. Now, I'm not sure how much metal George is listening to, but if you look up the lyrics to Raining Blood by Slayer, a lot of the symbolism, like Pierce from Below, Souls of My Treacherous Past, they fit quite well with, with the scenery that Ned's, that Ned's talking about. <laughs> I mean, you can pull up the lyrics if you want to. I, I have them pulled up. Uh, trapped in purgatory, a lifeless object alive, waiting rep- reprisal, death will be their acquittance. The sky is turning red, return to power draws near, 
fallen to me, the sky's crimson tears, abolish the rules made of stone. Metal as bleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I always say, like, ice and fire is pretty freaking metal at times. It definitely is. Um, whether, yeah, maybe we know George is a deadhead, but that wouldn't surprise me. A lot of deadheads are closet metalheads. That yeah, is confirmed. Raining, raining blood in 1986. That's right up his alley. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, Robert will never keep to one bed. Leanna had told him at Winterfell on the night long ago when their father had promised her hand to the young Lord of Storm's End. I hear he's gotten a child on some girl in the Vale. Ned had held the babe in his arms, and that's Maya Stone, by the way. He could scarcely deny her, nor would he lie to his sister. But he had assured her that what Robert did before their betrothal was of no matter, that he was a good man and true who would love her with all his heart. Leanna had only smiled. Love is sweet, dearest Ned, but it cannot change a man's nature. What do you think about that? I mean, I should yeah, mention like, that there's a lot of RLJ clues in these two chapters. Mm -hmm. um, they're at the brothel because they were just visiting one of Robert's bastards. So Ned is thinking about King's bastards and his old guilts having to do with RLJ. And then this is going to lead up to the Tower of Joy. So there's a lot of RLJ commentary and a lot of parallels between Robert and Rhaegar and all these bastard children. So it's beginning yeah. here. Where now Ned is thinking about old guilts. So maybe this is another one of those guilts where he reassures Leanna, oh, Robert will love you. And now we've seen that, that Ned saw through Robert's love of Leanna. Like he tells Robert, you didn't even know her. And Robert is like, oh, she should be buried on a hill. And he's like, nah, her place is here. Like he corrects him over and over. He's, he's all, he's bitching about Cersei, uh, preventing him from fighting in the melee. And Ned's like, Leanna would have told you not to fight and told you you were a fool. Like, yeah. So I think <laughs> when, when, when Ned's saying that to Robert now, compared to this memory that he's spiritually with Leanna, that comes after 17 years of hindsight. Like we got to put ourselves in Ned's shoes as an 18 year old kid conflict, conflict it between three people right now the things that his sister's telling him him trying to be good to his best friend and then also knowing how important these marriage alliances that his father has been building are to him so yeah like i said like uh for for ned in that moment as a young man trying to like reassure that his sister like no no robert he's he's a good guy he's my friend but also still knowing like nah you know there's that scummy nature to him. Like, you know he's already fathered a child. But at the same time, Ned's just like, well, I don't, I don't know. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll change. Maybe he'll do the right thing. And now he knows after, as years have passed, he's like, no, she was right. This is it. This all, Cersei or her or whoever Robert married, this was always bound to happen. He was always going to father bastards. He was always going to have one night stands. It, it, it was inevitable. Yeah, like you could see this line is just ringing out in his memory. Robert will never keep to one bed. Mm -hmm. Love is sweet, dearest Ned, but it cannot change a man's nature. Like that is just ringing out 17 years later. Ned can hear those words in his head. What a great way to develop the characters of Robert and Ned at the same time. We see Ned used to be more idealistic and that that has been broken. His image of Robert has changed. And we see, you know, Leanna's character being built. As we discussed in the Leanna stream, she's perceptive as women are forced to be in this world because they're being promised off, uh, you know, in betrothals at this age, 14, 15. So, yeah, she's got to grow up fast. And she does seem to be a perceptive person. She does see through to Robert's nature. And we know eventually she seems to have made a choice to go with Rhaegar for various reasons, not just because she liked him better than Robert, but... That was probably part of it. So, and then Robert, we see, is like kind of always had these seeds of impulse control and gluttony and stuff like that. So, it makes you question again Ned's decision to leave Robert to run the kingdom uh, when 
his nature was already somewhat apparent. So this is maybe another thing that Ned has a regret about. Yeah. Yeah, also, like, love Jordan didn't said, change Ned's nature. Um, I'm not sure how you mean that, okay, Cucumber, but I think I agree with you. Robert always had these seeds, LML 2023. Yeah, spitting poetry <laughs> over here. It's Garth the Green with his heavy bag of seed. Heavy sack. Um, okay, pick it up with The Girl Had Been So Young. Uh, the Girl Had Been So Young, Ned had not dared to ask her age. No doubt she'd been a virgin. The better brothels could always find a virgin if the purse was fat enough. She had light red hair and a powdering of freckles across the bridge of her nose. And when she slipped free of breast to give her nipple to the babe, he saw that her bosom was freckled as well. I named her Bara, she said as the child nurse. She looks so like him, does she not, my lord? She has his nose and his hair. Okay, so... Bara... Because her dad is Robert Baratheon, right? So if the mm -hmm. pattern holds, John's real name is Targa. <laughs> I thought of that last night. Ugh. Yeah. Good material. Targa. It's pretty it's silly. Like Bear is a better name, obviously, but it's mm -hmm. like the last thing that you should do is name the kid a name that gives away <laughs> that he's Robert's bastard. Like... It's just yeah. showing you like how naive and young this girl is. That's the point of the name is to show you like she's 14 or 15, heartbreakingly young. Okay. Like that's how Ned, like even in this world, Ned's like, damn, you know, <laughs> um, she's just so young and she's so innocent. And oh, I'm, I'm waiting for him. You know, I don't want any jewels. I just want to be good. You know, blah, blah. He was good to me. And Ned's just like, he doesn't love you. And he might even see a little echo. Not an echo of Leanna, but like. It's a it's there's a parallel to the situation. Leanna was like, he won't be good to me. And Ned's like, yeah, he will. And now here's another young girl. With Robert's pastor going, yeah, I, he was good to me. And Ned's like, mm -hmm. no, nah, he wasn't. He he left you with a baby and forgot about you. Yeah. Like. So, yeah, it's an inverted situation, but we're meant to, like, see these parallels. And again, that's, like, part of... That's why I was saying, Leanna, you know, not all teenagers in Westeros are the same as far as agency or in the real world. You know, Leanna is raised as a Stark, and her older brother, Brandon, taught her swordplay, okay? So she, she's got privilege, she's got training, she's got gifts, she's got intelligence... This poor girl has somehow become a brothel worker here at the age of whatever it is. You know, the best ones can always find virgins. Like, this is a different life that this person has led. You mm -hmm. know, so we're supposed to just observe that. Like, there's different ways things can go. And, like, yeah, George is showing people with different, age, different levels of agency different levels of victimization and uh yeah man you just you got to stop and appreciate the um the just the gut-wrenching reality of what's going on here it's like robert baratheon went to a brothel was like can i get a virgin got her pregnant so he didn't pull out okay then he moved on like yeah this is why Robert's not a good person. And I want to make this point because we joke about Robert and I do the voice and all this stuff, but like he's a very different person than Ned. And that's why him and Ned grew apart. And that's why Ned judged him for a lot of his actions. Cause Ned is a morally upright character. Robert is not likable, but not, yeah. not morally upright. <laughs> anyway, anything to add or, I mean, no, I think you pretty much nailed it all yeah sometimes you just be reading these chapters and looking at symbolism and all of a sudden it'll occur to you be like oh there's something horrible going on i guess we should you know put our mind yeah. in that space for a minute and because that's like part of the story but yeah we bounce around here on the stream this is how we do it there's multiple things going on in the writing but always the human aspect comes first so 
All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we? So uh, She looks she like him, does she not, him. my lord? She has his nose. Uh, she does. Eddard Stark had touched the baby's fine, dark hair. And remember, he held Robert's first bastard, Maya Stone. They just said that. You know, Ned had held her and couldn't lie to Leanna about it. And so here he is again. Touched the baby's fine, dark hair. It flowed through his fingers like black silk. Robert's firstborn had had the same fine hair, he seemed to recall. And again, that's Maya Stone. <clears throat> tell him that when you see it, my lord. As it, as it please you. Tell him how beautiful she is. I will. Ned had promised her. That was his curse. Robert would swear undying love and forget them before even fall, but Ned Stark kept his vows. He thought of the promises he'd made to Lyanna as, as she lay dying and the price he'd paid to keep them. And that's the lie to Catelyn, as well as mm -hmm. other things, yeah. After hearing, this is Gerald Garcia, Squisher, after hearing Lyanna criticize Robert's whoring and then dies, uh, he bans prostitution from Winterfell. It seems like he took the lesson of heart for sure. Oh, I didn't, I never knew. So Ned, Ned banned prostitution from Winterfell. I didn't know that. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, that might have been a little bit of a reaction to, to Robert, certainly. Interesting. Assuming that's correct. <clears throat> okay, uh, where were we here? Uh, and tell him I've not been with no one else. I, I swear it, my lord, by the old gods and new. Shatai said I could have half a year for the baby and for hoping he'd come back. So you tell him I'm waiting, won't you? I, I don't want no jewels or nothing, just him. He was always good to me, truly. Good to you, Ned thought hollowly. I will tell him, child, and I promise you, Bera shall not go wanting. So here we see, like, Ned immediately takes more responsibility for this child than Robert ever did. Mm -hmm. And that's just speaks for itself. I will just keep reading. She had smiled then, a smile so tremulous and sweet that it cut the heart out of him. Riding through the rainy night, Ned saw Jon Snow's face in front of him, so like a younger version of his own. If the gods frowned so on bastards, he thought dully, why did they fill men with such lusts? Okay. So let's stop right there. This is RLJ time. We've just been thinking about this girl and how she parallels Maya Stone as well as Leanna. So he's thinking about bastard children. He's thinking about Leanna. And then all of a sudden, Jen, J he sees Jon Snow's face in front of him. And he thinks about bastards. And he's like, why did they fill men with such lusts? You know what he's not thinking is, why did the gods fill me with such lusts that I had this bastard, Jon Snow? Mm -hmm. He's not thinking about Jon Snow's mother, Shara Dane, throwing herself yeah. from the tower because she couldn't raise her son or something. Like, look at what he's thinking about. He's thinking about Lyanna yeah, not... and Jon. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. You're like, he's not thinking of John as his bastard son. He's not thinking of him in that sense. So yeah, no, or, that right yeah, there. Why did, I, why did the guy, why did I, oh, I can't believe I was like Robert that one time. Like he's thinking about mm -hmm. lies and things that he did to cover up. He's not thinking about, I, I wanted to point this out. The reason why, another reason why a shark and Ned can't be John's parents, which was my favorite alternate, you know, theory uh, way back in the day because that would have been such a dishonoring of Ashara. Ashara was unwed and Ned Stark was already wed to Kat. Mm -hmm. um, or no, he wasn't wed to Kat at Harrenhal. I take that back. He was wed to Kat um, during the war. Uh, yeah. But the theory... Um, okay, so take that part out. Nevertheless... Uh, getting a Shardane pregnant out of wedlock is would be a big dishonoring. Um, that is not something that would cause the Danes to name Edric after Ned. Uh, mm -hmm. And Ned would be feeling guilty and thinking about a Shardane and how he ruined her life and then she committed suicide because of him. He doesn't think about that. 
It's very sad, mm -hmm. but it's not personally something that he has to chew on because it was his fault. So this is the thing about RLJ. Like it's maybe there is a video out there that can explain why it's fact in like 10 minutes, but really it comes from like reading through all these details and looking at Ned's inner monologue in all well, these I chapters and go ahead. I think we have our answer with Rob Stark, where if, if Ned had knowingly gotten a Shara Dane pregnant, he probably would have, he's the type of guy who would have broken off his betrothal with Kat to marry Ashara instead. The same way that Rob breaks the betrothal with the phrase to marry Jane Westerling because he gets her pregnant or he believes he's gotten her pregnant. Like that's, that, that's true. that honor. And if Rob has that kind of honor and Ned has that honor on like even more, like on an even more extreme side, like I think that's what we're supposed to take from it. So my theory devoted to Mariah on why Ned banned anyone mentioning Ashara's name at Winterfell. I think because it makes it really obvious. It makes the cover story better. Okay. Like the fact that he got, gets reacted so strongly to that and was like, never speak her name. It's like, Oh, okay. Well, that one hit close to home, didn't it? You know, like, it sells the story because I think that is supposed to be the cover story. Like we're not saying it's a Shara's, but like she's dead. So it mm -hmm. makes a convenient story now that like, Oh, that's who John's mother is. And again, they didn't know if John was going to turn out with purple eyes or a little silver streak. And if Shara Dane is the rumored mother, then that gives an excuse of why he doesn't have to be a Targaryen. So, yeah, I think that I think that's part of laying a false trail. Thank you, Scott May. Um, the other alternative is that he simply respects Ashara, or maybe he was in love with her, um, and does not want her name sullied. Uh, but I really think it's part of the cover story, the false yeah. trail. As for Ned can't break it off because he needs it for the war. Well, again, Rob needed the Frey marriage for his war, but he broke it off because. His sense of honor outweighed his sense of honor towards Jane Westerling outweighed that. So I think with Ned, it would have been a, the same case if that had been the scenario. I also think it was Brandon that liked or may have slept with Ashara between the two Starks. But I also think that the theory that it may have been Ares who dishonored her and then she turned to Brandon and Ned and the Starks is pretty good as well. So. Well, we're going to do, um, Leanna is not on her bed of blood at Winterfell, Adrian. She's on her bed of blood in the Tower of Joy. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I'm confused by your question, but we're going to read the scene. So let's see. Um, Lord Baelish, what do you know of Robert's bastards? Well, he has more than you for a start. How many? Littlefinger shrugged, rivulets of moisture twisted down the back of his cloak. Doesn't matter. If you bet enough women, some will give you presents. And his grace has never been shy on that count. I know he's acknowledged that boy at Storm's End, the one he fathered the night Lord Stannis wed. He could hardly do otherwise. The mother was a Florent, niece to the Lady Solice, one of her bedmaids. Renly says that Robert carried the girl upstairs during the feast and broke in the wedding bed while Stannis and his bride were still dancing. Lord Stannis seemed to think that that was a blot on the honor of his wife's house, so when the boy was born, he shipped him off to Renly. He gave Ned a sideways glance. I've also heard whispers that Robert got a pair of twins on a serving wench at Casterly Rock three years ago when he went west for Lord Tywin's tourney. Cersei had the babes killed and sold the mother to a passing slaver. Too much an affront to Lannister pride that close to home. Let's pause right there. That if that is true, I believe that they had they were killed. Sold the mother to a slaver. I can see Cersei doing that. And if it's true, then that means she did the same thing that Jorah that earned Jorah a death sentence from Ned Stark, mm -hmm. or at least a wall sentence, one or the other. Probably a death sentence. J Jorah thought it would be. And then instead here, we see perhaps 
the Lord of Castle Rock or his daughter was involved in selling somebody as a slave. So, you know, hard to miss these things. These, these, this is why we have this vague idea that the Starks are good and the Lannisters are bad. As we get more characters through history, we realize, okay, individuals, everybody's different. Every house has good and bad individuals. Of course, that's how the world works. But in the mm -hmm. main story, like Tywin, pretty bad person. Cersei, pretty bad person. Tyrion, getting into a wor becoming a worse person. And Jaime is sort of floating in the middle where he's like cynical and nihilistic, but sometimes does the right thing just for like shits and giggles. Versus Ned Stark, who's taking responsibility for children, um, upholding the law of, against slavery, you know. So it's not for nothing that we don't, that we think that way uh, about the Starks. It's largely Ned's reputation that, that does, that creates that idea. Okay. So let's see. Ned Stark grimaced. Ugly tales like that were told of every great Lord in the realm. He could believe it of Cersei Lannister readily enough, <laughs> but would the King stand by and let it happen? The Robert he had known would not have, but the Robert he had known had never been so practiced at shutting his eyes to things he did not wish to see. So he's still coming to terms with how far Robert has fallen. Like, mm -hmm. even though he got into a fight with him right during the war and obviously is on very different terms than Robert. Um, and he's not the hand anymore at this point. Uh, because he's already stood up to Robert. So, like, he's still hanging on to this idea that, oh, Robert wouldn't do that, you know. But then he's like, well, Robert is a lot better at closing his eyes to stuff than I ever knew him to be. So that seems to be a coping mechanism he's developed to avoid dealing with stuff that's, you know, difficult. So why would John Aaron take a sudden interest in the king's baseborn children? The short man gave a sodden shrug. He was the king's hand. Doubtless Robert asked him to see that they were provided for. <laughs> that's, that's meant to be a joke. Ned was soaked through to the bone, and his soul had grown cold. <laughs> it had to be more than that, or why kill him? Littlefinger shook the rain from his hair and laughed. <laughs> now I see. Lord Aaron learned that his grace had filled the bellies of some whores and fishwives, and for that he had to be silent. Small wonder. Allow a man like that to live, and next he is like to blurt out that the sun rises in the east. There was no answer Ned Stark could give to that, but a frown. For the first time in years, he found himself remembering Rhaegar Targaryen. He wondered if Rhaegar had frequented brothels. Somehow, he thought not. And that is... Another important pillar in the whole RLJ thing is like just the character building. Like mm -hmm. even as Ned is sitting here thinking all this pretty bad shit about Robert, you know, re coming to the, the, like we just said, going to the brothel, asking for a young girl and then not taking responsibility and getting her pregnant. And it's like, Oh, would Rhaegar go to her? Probably not. Like, yeah, you know, Rhaegar's yeah, and it's a different kind of person. Yeah. This makes me think, because, like, last time, when last stream we did together, we were talking about, Jor like, the idea that Jorah is a bad person, but sometimes the show skews our view of him, and that's because of the actor. Because Ian Glenn is so such a good actor, and he's so damn handsome. And people are... And it is human nature where people forgive... are more quick to forgive people if they're good-looking. And it's kind of the same here with Robert, like when we do these reads and we're thinking Robert only as the book character, it's easier to see how shittier he was compared to the Robert we saw on the show. And that's because Mark Addy was just so damn entertaining. It softened Robert's appeal a lot to us as viewers. It did, of course. And that's who I'm really impersonating is Mark Addy's Robert, obviously. That, that voice yeah. comes from him. So, And he's doing like a Ren Faire, King Henry the Eighth kind of thing, which is... You know, yeah. that's why we all appreciate it so much. It's very familiar. The other thing about this line is that if Rhaegar had abducted Lyanna, and mm -hmm. 
then Ned would hate him for it, one, which we never see. And two, this inner monologue would sound something like this. He wondered if Rhaegar had frequented brothel. Somehow he thought not. Rhaegar Targaryen would just take what he wanted without paying because he's a thief and a rapist. Like, there's no... There, that energy mm-hmm. is not there at all. There's no animosity towards Rhaegar. There's no condemnation, even. Yeah. So Because if we were... If we were to take Robert as wor- at his word about the kind of guy Rhaegar was, you would think he's just the Mad King writ younger. Like, the apple didn't far, fall far from the tree on that one. But when we get to know Rhaegar through other people's perspective, it seems like, no, he was a completely different person from his father. But yeah, again, and then like the other said, big one is that the... Oh, sorry, Tim, go ahead. I was, just, I was just saying, like, you wouldn't know that hearing only Robert's perspective on it. Exactly. And then we have the Dornish who are still trying, right after the Robert becomes king, they're trying to make secret wedding alliances with more Targaryens, whether it's Viserys or then later Danny. So, like, they mm-hmm. obviously don't hate Rhaegar or the Targaryens either. Um, so, yeah, the more you think about it, it's like, hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, it's the-, the rain was falling harder now, stinging the eyes and drumming against the ground. Rivers of black water were running down the hill, When Jory called out. Okay, stop right there. So the red rain, the blood rain, has become black water. So this is like your waves of blood and night symbolism. Because remember, I said the red rain, it's essentially apocalyptic long night symbolism. And so here we've got the black water. I used to talk about this more, but it's essentially, you know, the flood of dark, the, the clouds that blot out the sky. It's like squid ink in the water or a flood of black water. And we see the Blackwater Rush River used for symbolism. It flows from the God's Eye, Tim. And the God's Mm -hmm. Eye, of course, with the Isle of Faces as the moon and the lake as the sun, is basically a picture of the moon wandering too close to the sun, which is the moment of the apocalypse. So, for example, Tywin Lannister, a solar figure, sends his hellhounds, his dogs, Tywin's dogs, to spread blood and fire all around the God's eye. It's a sentence, literally a sentence that's constructed like that. Um, so it's like, oh, the, the, the hellhounds of the sun, meaning like the fiery meteors that come from the sun, they're all spreading blood and fire around the God's eye, with the God's eye being a picture of the celestial alignment. So there's blood and fire in the sky, bleeding stars, and then from that flows the black water, the waves of darkness, the waves of night. So remember, I've got, I've got Foam Keeper here, right? Which is a copy of mm-hmm. Oath Keeper. The red and black waves in the sword are waves of night and blood. And it's, it's a, a phrase that is repeated several times in the books. And it's also applied to visions of what seems to be Euron and other stuff like that. So waves of night and blood, it's all talking about darkness and bleeding stars. And so here we've got, um, I like the drumming as, as well, because you think of Dagon drum, the necromancer, uh, and it is, it is house drum that has red rain, is it not? Yes, yes, it is. So we've, we've just been saying, oh, the blood rain, and the, word, the phrase red rain is about to come. And so here we've got the drumming. So it tells you, like, the ironborn sigil construction as like long night symbolism already happening here in the first book. So there's a lot that George was already developing, you know, or it could be that he hadn't invented Dagon drum, the necromancer yet, but that was like something he invented to flesh out the symbolism of the drumming, you know, the sound. So anyways, Jory called out, my Lord, his voice hoarse with alarm, and in an instant, the street was full of soldiers. Would you go ahead and pick it up? Ned glimpsed ringmail over leather, gauntlets and greaves, steel helms with golden lions on the crests. Their cloaks clung to their backs, sodden with rain. He had no time to count, but there were ten at least, a line of them on foot, blocking the street with long swords and iron-tipped spears. Behind, he heard Will cry, And when he turned his horse, there were more in back of them, cutting off their retreat. 
Jory's sword came singing from its scabbard. Make way or die. The wolves are howling, their leader said. Ned could see running down his face. Such a small pack, though. Littlefinger walked his horse forward, step by careful step. What is the meaning of this? This is the hand of the king. He was the hand of the king. The mud muffled the hooves of the blood bay stallion. The line parted before him. On a golden breastplate, the lion of, lion of Lannistor roared its defiance. Now, if truth be told, I'm not sure what he is. Lannister, this is madness, Littlefinger said. Let us pass. We are expected back at the castle. What do you think you're doing? He knows what he's doing, Ned said calmly. And here we'll stop for a second. There's a couple of interesting things. Um, love the writing for Jamie here. Uh, you know, this is just the sort of edgy thing that Jamie would do, understanding that Ned's in a position of weakness. He's no longer technically hand of the king, and he's on the outs with Robert. Um, and of course, Jamie is mad about the abduction of Tyrion by Catelyn right now. And so he sees the opportunity to exact retribution. And he's correct. There is Ned is weak politically here. Um, so you see that reflected in Jamie's statements. Like now, if truth be told, I'm not, I'm not sure what he is. Uh, such a small pack, you know, like it's very taunting. It's a different sort of trolling than Littlefinger. And it just shows you like George can write two different kinds of trolls in the same scene. And they still feel a little bit different. So thought that's pretty cool. Um, I missed earlier for RLJ. Ned said he's cursed to keep vows. He wouldn't say that if he broke his marriage vows. That's true. And it, it also said, you know, Robert, uh, you know, uh, Ned kept his vows. That was a line earlier in the sentence. Yeah, very true. So then we've got the Blood Bay. Remember I just said Blackwater Rush flows out from the God's Eye into the Blackwater Bay. You know, waves of blood and night. Well, a bay full of waves of blood and night. That could be a black water bay or a bay of blood. So this is a horse, of course. And nobody um, swims in a horse, of course. But Jamie, <laughs> as the solar king, he's, he's the antagonistic son. And he is unle he's riding on a blood bay. It's a similar idea as waves of blood coming from the god's eye, which represents that long night sun that's being destroyed. So, yeah. Blood Bay. Not B-A-E Bay. I mean, I guess in Valeria, maybe. <laughs> uh, Jory's voice was hoarse because the horse that broke Ned's leg was time-traveling Tyrek Lannister. Oh, Vermeer, I thought you, were, <laughs> thought you had something for a minute. You totally <laughs> trolled me. But you're no, but uh, you're probably right to call attention to Jory's voice being hoarse. Could be weird with Ned speak because of the whole Yggdrasil thing, but we'll see. Let's keep reading. Yeah. So, Jamie, La are you my, are you our lion of Lannister, Damon? You show up right when Jamie shows up. Jamie Lannister smiled. Quite true. I'm looking for my brother. You remember my brother, don't you, Lord Stark? He was with us at Winterfell. Fair-haired, mismatched eyes, sharp of tongue, a short man. <laughs> I remember him well, Ned replied. It would seem he has met some trouble on the road. My lord father is quite vexed. You would not perchance have any notion of who might have wished my brother ill, would you? Your brother has been taken at my command to answer for his crimes, Ned Stark said. Littlefinger groaned in dismay. My lord, Sir Jamie, ripped his longsword from his sheath and urged his stallion forward. Show me your steel, Lord Eddard. I'll butcher you like Eris if I must, but I'd sooner you died with a blade in your hand. He gave a Littlefinger a cool, contemptuous glance. Lord Baelish... I'd leave here in some haste if I did not care to get blood stains on my costly clothing. Littlefinger Little... did not need to be urged. I will bring the city watch, he promised Ned. The Lannister line part, uh, 
that story. I was reading that like he was speaking still. The Lannister line parted to let him through and closed behind him. Littlefinger put his heels to his mare and vanished around a corner. Ned's men had drawn their swords. And anytime we see mare also, we could think about dream horses and stuff. So just put a pin in that. Littlefinger disappeared into a dream, potentially. He vanished around a corner. Notice the word vanished. You know, put his heels to his mare and vanished. Like, it's very... Ned's men had drawn their swords, but they were three against twenty. And again, Tower of Joy is seven against three. Eyes watched from nearby windows and doors, but no one was about to intervene. At the Tower of Joy, the eyes of the others are watching. Remember, the rose petals are as blue as the eyes of death in the sky. So here we got the similar motif. The eyes are watching the fight. His party was mounted, the Lannisters on foot, save for Jaime himself. A charge might win them free, but it seemed to Eddard Stark they had a sure, safer tactic. Kill me, he warned the Kingslayer, and Catelyn will most certainly slay Tyrion. Jaime Lannister poked at Ned's chest with the gilded sword that had sipped the blood of the last of the Dragon Kings. Would she? The noble Catelyn Tully of Riverrun murder a hostage? I think not, he sighed. That's interesting, because, not- hold on, Jamie will later be Kat's hostage. <laughs> and she sets him free, but, like, th- almost looks like she's going to murder him. So that's a bit of, you know, cheeky writing there. Keep going, though. But I am not willing to chance my brother's life on a woman's honor. Jamie slid the golden sword into its sheath. So I suppose I'll let you run back to Robert to tell him how I frightened you. I wonder if he'll care. Jamie pushed his wet hair back with his fingers and wheeled his horse around. When he was beyond the line of swordsmen, he glanced back at his captain. Traeger, see that no harm comes to Lord Stark. As you say, my lord. Still, we wouldn't want him to leave here entirely unchastened, so... Through the night and the rain, he glimpsed the white of Jamie's smile. Kill his men. Okay, so the white smile, that's probably some otherish language. And I believe uh, we're going to see other symbolism applied to the Lannister soldiers in just a minute. But yes, the chat is correct. One of the best lines. Jamie Lannister poked at Ned's chest with the gilded sword that had sipped the blood of the last of the Dragon Kings. That's some epic shit. So, pretty dope. <clears throat> um, no, Ned Stark screamed, clawing for his sword. Jamie was already cantering off down the street as he heard Will shout. Men closed from both sides. Ned rode one down, cutting at phantoms in red cloaks, who gave way before him. Yeah, so there you go, phantoms. Jory Cassell put his heels into his mount and charged. A steel-shod hoof caught a Lannister guardsman in the face with a sickening crunch. Because remember, Jory's mounted. The Lannister phantoms are not. Uh, A second man reeled away, and for an instant, Jory was free. Will cursed as they pulled him off his dying horse, swords slashing in the rain. So there's more red rain, blood sword symbols. Ned galloped to him, bringing his longsword down on Treger's helm. The jolt of impact made him grit his teeth. Traeger stumbled to his knees, the, his lion crest sheared in half, blood running down his face. So that's probably a, a sun-killing symbol there, since it's a lion helm being split in half. Heward was hacking at the hands that had seized his bridle when a spear caught him in the belly. Suddenly, Jory was back among them, a red rain flying from his sword. So there's the red rain. And it's literally, like I said, flying from the sword. So it definitely makes us think of the sword called Red Rain. Um, No, Ned shouted. Jory, away! Ned's horse slipped under him and came crashing down in the mud. There was a moment of blinding pain and the taste of blood in his mouth. He saw them cut the legs from Jory's mount and drag him to the earth, swords rising and falling as they closed in around him. So there's some astronomical language. Something or someone is being dragged to the earth. So that's either a moon or a moon meteor. It's the same idea, but that's obviously what's dragged down to the earth. 
If somebody wants to look up the meaning of the word jewelry and cassell, that would be dope. I won't stop to do it, but somebody like Carson Ark will. When Ned's horse lurched back to its feet, he tried to rise, only to fall again, choking on his scream. He could see the splintered bone poking through his calf. So that's what I was saying is weirwood net symbol, because the weirwoods are blood and bone. And so his, as his white bone picks, you know, peeks out from the blood, it's splintered, which is a wood, where wood splinters are made of wood. It was the last thing he saw for a time. The rain came down and down and down. When he opened his eyes again, Lord Eddard Stark was alone with his dead. His horse moved closer, caught the rank scent of blood, and galloped away. Ned began to drag himself through the mud, gritting his teeth at the agony in his leg. It seemed to take years, so now that there's a time warp happening. Faces watched from candlelit windows, and people began to emerge from alleys and doors, but no one moved to help. Littlefinger and the City Watch found him in the street, cradling Jory Cassell's body in his arms. Somewhere the gold cloaks found a litter, but the trip back to the castle was a blur of agony, and Ned lost consciousness more than once. He remembered seeing the Red Keep looming ahead of him in the first gray light of dawn. The red, the rain had darkened the pale pink stone of the massive walls to the color of blood. So, oh, last paragraph. Then Grand Maester Pycelle was looming over him, holding a cup, whispering, Drink, my lord, here, the milk of the poppy, for your pain. He remembered swallowing, and Pycelle was telling someone to heat the wine to boiling and fetch him clean silk. And that was the last he knew. Okay, so obviously I'm interpreting this as him going into the weirwood net. It's, it seems like he's turning into a dream sequence. Everybody's dead. He's the only one alive. It sounds like a dream or a nightmare or the afterlife. Um, he's, it seems to take years, so there's a time warp going on. And then uh, he's losing consciousness. The Red Keep is now made of blood. And he's being carried towards it. Um, and there's a first gray light of dawn. So this... He's being carried to a castle made of blood. And he can also see the light of dawn. So I would call this... He's going to a confrontation with Night's King. Who will be played by Arthur Dane in the next chapter wielding a sword that gives off the light of dawn. So you see why it's important to read the chapters one to the other, because it's very obvious what this is referring to when you, we're going to jump right to Arthur Dane unsheathing dawn. So he's being carried towards a castle of blood. What's the Tower of Joy? It's a tower that's literally raining blood out the window. Leanna's blood is in the dream, you know, her bloody roses are blowing out the window and the sky is painted in blood. So it's the same symbolism here. And when we think about, of course, weirwood net symbolism, it's a big bloody tree with a bloody mouth that is the entrance to the realm of the dead. So Ned Stark, and then the last bit, the maesters who parallel children of the forest gives him milk of the poppy, which is like weirwood paste. And then he blacks out. So... Let's go to the Tower of Joy chapter, but go ahead and give me your thoughts. You, you like, do you like my flow there, Tim? Yeah, I was also thinking, too, uh, the line about the lion, uh, Traegar's lion, lion helm being split in half. Because um, when we think of, like, the, the Night's King story, but also Bloodstone Emperor and all that, because all, all these folk tales that are essentially what they are, are tied up between both East and West. When we look at, like, the Eastern version with Azor Ahai, there's also the myth of the Lion of the Night. So, so I think some of the lion imagery is also meant to invoke that and how how these are just like the uh, this story is like an Eastern and Western version all, all right. of the same story. You're right. Because yeah. the Lion of Night and the Maiden Maid of Light, as I've always maintained, are both solar symbols. And it is expressing the day-night duality of the sun. So if you split that, that's what the long night mm -hmm. is. They're no longer working as a cycle. The Maiden Maid of Light hides her face. And the Lion of Night comes out with his demons and punishes the world, and it's dark. So that, that fits. Because it's the splitting of the cycle. That's what's being sundered. The harmony of everything. The song is being ruined, if you will. 
let me, uh, I think I might have missed a couple super chats. Um, does this symbolizing, and by the way, Milk of the Poppy is not actually weirwood paste. That's symbolism. Mm -hmm. It's a white, porridge stuff that you drink that makes you lose consciousness. Or, you know, yeah, numbs milk your milk. mind, makes you intoxicated, I mean, whatever. It's essentially morphine. It is, yes. Um, yeah. Does this symbolizing Azor going into the weirwood net show that Azor had tragic intentions like Ned instead of malicious intentions no, because I think Ned is not Azor High here, but the last hero. And the last hero is, it's confusing because they're echoing archetypes. But in general, there is, there does seem to be a heroic Azor High archetype that aligns with the last hero and a villainous one that sort of becomes Night's King. I think. It's, I don't, hold me to that, but I, that's kind of what I see. <clears throat> So I believe that what Ned's doing here is heroic last hero stuff. I don't see him doing the sort of invade. There's no invading light. He's not invading anything. He's not, um, you know, he's not invading the Tower of Joy. Like his sister's in there and they've won the war. These dead enders are the ones who are like kind of still holding on to the fight instead of just, settling because like they could have settled with robert and ned you know like robert kept our uh what's his name barristan and his king's guard right mm -hmm. <clears throat> um so no i i don't think so sri lankan but that's a good question and it's an open question and not one that you know there is a scenario where maybe the last hero becomes knight's king he's trying to save things and he ruins things but i really feel like knight's king comes first that's the great sin. Like, Azor becomes Knight's King when he causes the long night. Then later we need the last hero to come along. It's not, everything isn't all one event. So, I think Azor Ahai is already in the Weirwood Net. You know, like, because we see, like, Knight's Queen is already pregnant. Baby John's there. Rhaegar's dead at this point. I think Arthur is symbolizing Knight's King here. But Rhaegar is the other one for Lyanna, and she's, he's dead. So, um, yeah, I really think this is last hero stuff, but let's go. Ned saw the gray light of dawn. He saw a bloody castle. And now we're picking up with the Tower of Joy. He dreamt an old dream of three knights in white cloaks and a tower long fallen and Lyanna in her bed of blood. In the dreams, his friends rode with him as they had in life. Proud Martin Cassell, Jory's father, faithful Theo Wall, Ethan Glover, who had been Brandon Squire, Sir Mark Riswell, soft of speech and gentle of heart, and the Cranog men, Howland Reed, Lord Dustin on his great red stallion. Let's see, Ned had known their faces as well as he had known his own ones, but the years leech at a man's memories, and even those, even those he vowed never to forget. In the dream, they were only shadows, Gray wraiths on horses made of mist. Okay. Oh, that's others. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, well, no, it's not. That's what I'm saying is that I think these these are, well, it's all kind of mixed up, but it, usually it's the, it's the uh, Kingsguard that are others. That are others. Okay. But, but the he... thing is what I, the last hero he is a wraith at this point. And remember, the first Night's Watchmen all have death symbolism. The Night's Watchmen are like wraiths and ghosts and shadows. And the Green Zombies theory says that the last hero and his companions were killed and resurrected through weirwood magic somehow. But that could very easily involve a trip into the weirwood net. Okay? That may even be the resurrection is the second life in the weirwood net. I think, I think he's actually physically reborn. But that's why they're wraiths. And notice that um, there's continuations between the companions in the, the scene that um, just took place in the real world and this one here in the dream world. So Jory Cassell was with him, and now in the dream it's Martin Cassell. Um, one of his but companions here... was Will. And here there's Theo Wall and Mark Rizwell. Um, and then the other companion was... Uh, who was Ned's other companion in the fight just now that died? 
that was pulled from his horse. Jory? Or no, Will? before Jory. Uh, in the last chapter, that was Will. Well, there's Will and Jory and one other one. Or maybe it's just the serving man and not the not a knight, but there's one other name. I gotta go back to it. Yeah. It is. Um oh. Oh, it's this added one. Okay, sorry. Sorry, dead air time. One second, guys. I just got to get this name. Uh, it says there were three against 20, but then I thought there was another name. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm not wrong. I think it's just, I think Ned is just our third. Traeger and... Will, oh, Will cursed as they pulled it from his dying horse. I just thought there was another man. Nope. Okay. I guess I'm wrong. Sorry. Oh, jury equals jury. Twelve peers. A jury is <laughs> last year's companions. I don't know about that. <laughs> Three including Ned. Okay. I'm wrong. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I could have sworn there was another name though. Because I noticed it when we were reading, and I was like, who's that? Oh, well. I'm tripping, I guess. Maybe I was thinking of Traeger. But I thought there was... um. Nah, because Traeger is Jamie's man. Yeah, I know that. Okay, well, let's go back to the other chapter. Tripping. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Okay. Um, well, like I said, Jory and Will's names are both sort of repeated here in Rizwell and then Jory's dad. So it's kind of like those... Heward, thank you, Heward. Oh, he's in the brothel. Okay. So at least I'm not completely inventing something. So Heward, and then here we have Howland. So that's what I was saying. Like, even the name Heward is similar to Howland. So it really seems like Ned's companions from the last scene are now with him again, but they're wraiths now, so they're dead. Just like Ned has symbolically entered the dream world. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you, chat. God. <laughs> Makes sense, though, right? Mm -hmm. Five minutes later. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, it's awesome that all the names are there. So pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, and that just shows you that it's meant to be a continuation, a continuing idea. And that David Lightbringer is not crazy. He's just, the memory's <laughs> a little slippery, but praise God. All right, will you pick it up with, uh, they were seven, facing three. Yeah. Okay, well, this is what I was trying to interject with, because with this, I, what I, because I know you, I had said that that was others, and you were saying no, because uh, we're supposed to look at the King's Guard as others, but here, they were seven, facing three, but if we go back to the prologue, that's how many others there are against Waymar, Will, and Garrett. That's seven others against three. Yeah, there are some parallels and reversals going on here. And then also, yeah. where the Kingsguard are always called white shadows, here there are no shadows. Their faces are clear. Um, which maybe means that these are like original others or they're significant individuals who have been otherized or something like that. I'm not sure. It, I've always interpreted that as just serving the main plot. Like for Ned's dream, it's important that he can't remember his friends, but he does remember his enemies because it puts this status on their enemies, on Arthur Dane and the King's Guard. I think that is it. But absolutely, it, the seven and three is a flip of Waymar and the others. Yes. I don't think that means Ned is the others. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit the rest of the scene. But I and I'll, a lot of times George does do inverted parallels like that. So it just seems like he flipped mm -hmm. it so it wouldn't look exactly the same. If there was because there usually are seven Kingsguard, 
And by the way, it was six versus three in the prologue. Waymar becomes oh. the seventh when he flips. Okay. But that's it why it's seven on three. Watching. Okay. I thought it was six watching while they while Waymar fought the one, but no, that makes sense. No, All there's right, six. So they others. were seven. That's why the thing is the seventh. Um, the com- the seventh Kingsguard is the Lord Commander. So I'm saying that's the whole point of having six others, and then they convert Waymar, and it seems like they were looking for John. They want to convert yeah, John and Waymar. make him their Lord Commander, so to speak. Yeah, mistaking Waymar for John because he's got that look. Okay, back right here the numbers are they were, they were seven facing three in the dream as it had been in life. Yet these were no ordinary three. They waited before the round tower, the red mountains of Dorne at their backs, their white cloaks blowing in the wind. Okay, so that right, the red mountains and the white cloaks gives us our weirwood symbolism. Oh. Uh, and these were no shadows. Their faces burned clear even now. Sir Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning, had a sad smile on his lips. The hilt of the great sword Don poked up over his right shoulder. Sir Oswald Went was on one knee, sharpening his blade with a whetstone. Across his white enameled helm, the black bat of his house spread its wings. Between them stood fierce old Sir Gerald Hightower, the white bull, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Okay, so... Let's consider the way that this is laid out. Their faces are burning clear. Of course, nothing burns like the cold. So, um, but this could be could be a shout out to like the Great Empire of the Dawn origins <clears throat> of like Azor High and all that stuff. <clears throat> but we've got Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. Um, Dawn peeking up over his right shoulder, almost like the sunrise peeking up over the horizon there. Um, Oswald Went was on one knee, sharpening his blade. Across his white enameled helm, the black bat of his house spread its wings. So dark wings I always interpret as the, the darkness that covers the skies. That's how Drogon's wings are always used. They cloak the world in shadow. They cover the world in darkness. It's very obvious long night language. Because, of course, Drogon being a black dragon is a symbol of the black meteors that made the skies dark. So here we've got the black bat spreading its wings. It's kind of like, oh, I see, I see. On one side, it's a sunrise. And on one side, on the other side, it's a darkness. And in the middle is the high tower. So it's kind of like three-headed trios, where one head consumes the dying and the other head spits out the the reborn. It's, the, it's a yeah. cyclical thing here. So yeah, we've got... Dawn peeking yeah. over the shoulder, so that's like a sunrise. And on the other one, the the black bat spreading its wings over the white world, so that's a long night darkness. And in the middle, <clears throat> like a fulcrum, is Gerald Hightower. Now, Hightower is a very obvious weirdwood symbol. And when you see the Hightower sigil, it makes it obvious. It's the white tower crowned with a red ball of flame on top, just like the white tree are crowned with a head of red leaves, which are also called a blaze of flame. And the high tower is for what? It's for seeing far distances, just like the green seers see, and there might be a palantir glass candle up there, etc., etc. And of course, Blackstone Fortress underneath, made by dragon lords, fits with all the dragons that are always under the weirwoods, just like Yggdrasil has dragons under it. So Blood Raven is a dragon. He's underneath you know, the weirwood trees, the, the roots themselves look like uh, serpents and stuff. So, <clears throat> so here we've got um, basically a weirwood symbol with the sunrise and the, the darkness on either side. So it's, yeah, it's showing some kind of cycle. And of course, Gerald Hightower is also called the White Bull. He's about to die at the scene of John's birth. John is very comparable to Mithras for reasons that I will not go into right now, but Mithras mm-hmm. is always seen with a, a torch and a sword. So it's Lightbringer stuff. Um, is Yeah, I'm not going to go into it. I just said I wasn't going to go into it, and I started going into it. I'm not going to go into <laughs> it. John is Mithras. Well, Mithras has, has a friend that's the white bull. And in a famous depiction of uh, Mithras and the bull called the Tauroctony, Mithras ritually sacrifices the bull. 
and he has to do this in order to be reborn, people think. Our reconstruction of Mithraism is fuzzy. But the common belief is that Mithras is part of his rebirth, is to sadly kill his friend, the White Bull. So here, Gerald Hightower, the White Bull, is dying at John's birth instead of his rebirth. But John's rebirth will involve the sad sacrifice of his friend, the White Wolf, Ghost, as we know. So that will be another Mithras White Bull. John won't kill Ghost, but Ghost, Ghost's wolf body will die to resurrect John. Of course, his wolf spirit, his doggy spirit, will be with John in John's body. So we're just mourning the loss of flesh, not spirit. But it's more, it's, it's more white bull symbolism. He's, he's a good boy. Ghost is the best boy. The symbolism, I would, yeah, it's, it's, it's on the chain. The, the winged wolf was chained. So the symbolism is on the chain. <laughs> no, it's, it's great. It's terrific. So the black, okay. Between them stood fierce Gerald Hightower, the white bull, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Here begins the dialogue. So I'll do Ned, I guess you do the Kingsguard, right? <clears throat> I looked for you on the trident, Ned said to them. We were not there, Sir Gerald answered. Woe to the usurper if we had been, said Sir Oswell. When King's Landing fell, Sir Jamie slew your king with a golden sword, and I wondered where you were. Far away, Sir Gerald said. Or Eris would yet sit the Iron Throne, and our false brother would burn in seven hells. I came down on Storm's End to lift the siege, Ned told them, and Lord, Lords Tyrell and Redwine dipped their banners, and all their knights bent their knee to pledge us fealty. I was certain you would be amongst them. Our knees do not bend easily, said Sir Arthur Dane. Sir Willem Derry is fled to Dragonstone, with your queen and Prince Viserys. I thought you might have sailed with him. Sir Willem is a good man and true, said Sir Oswell. But not of the Kingsguard, Sir Gerald pointed out. The Kingsguard does not flee. Then or now, said Sir Arthur, he donned his helm. We swore a vow, explained old Sir Gerald. Um, here, uh... Sorry, I've, I'm just uh, always worried about. Okay, yeah. So this is this is where the dialogue definitely seems dreamlike and stylized. Uh, the way that their words are, it, it seems like there might be a longer conversation or argument here. But what you, what Ned's hearing are the no's. He's hearing all the mm -hmm. shutdowns, all the things that they said that made him understand they, was, they were going to have to fight. So there may have been a lot more to this conversation. I just want to remind everybody not to take it too literally. The way, I think the most obvious way to read this is like, again, these are the fateful words that are echoing in his mind almost two decades later. These are the words mm -hmm. that indicated, again, that people were going to have to die here. Ned's friends and these enemies, quote-unquote, whom he actually respected yeah i agree because these these seem like just snippets of a much bigger scene that we're not getting the full picture of because again this is a man having a morphine dream about something that's 20 happened like 20 years ago at this point so that's part of the reason why we say well why are the king's guards so stubborn? like they're not giving a reason they're just it just seems so dumb and pointless there's obviously missing information here. Um, some of it is about the stiff armor, the stiff, uh, sorry, artificial honor of the King's Guard, which we've broken down a couple times. They were enabling King Ares and all of his worst abuses and just going away inside while he raped his wife and burned people alive. Like it's not, it's a weird kind of honor that they hold to. And it is very stiff and artificial. It's probably meant to be contrasted with Ned's honor, which Ned is always willing to discard for the greater good. So mm -hmm. we, it could be that the King's Guard here had that choice and didn't make it, and they chose to stick to their honor and 
cause some more death and, and turmoil. But we can't be sure of that because, again, this is all stylized and there could be missing information. So, in general, I'm pretty hard on Ares' Kingsguard for enabling him. We just don't know exactly what they were about here at this tower. Although, mm -hmm. I'm interested if you have any guesses. Or like, sort of more specific mm -hmm. ones than the sort of normal ones. No, it, it is a juxtaposition showing uh, the false honor that the Kingsguard have swearing to their vows, even though their vows are made to a uh, are made to a man who doesn't deserve them, versus Ned's more genuine vows, even though Ned's or I mean Ned's more genuine honor, which is to go against that man. So I think that's what that's what we're looking at right here. Um, the white bull symbolism. Yes, I'm sorry, Tim. Yes, mm -hmm. I concur. And uh, I'm, I'm really bad at like, if I read something in the chat, it like causes me to interrupt. I'm sorry, guys. I have ADHD. I try to, try to monitor everything at once. But uh, Theory of Ice and Fire is pointing out the white bull does have other potential symbolic meanings. And there's yeah, a couple there's interesting the, ones. Uh, the they mentioned. Story. What's that? Uh, there's Voltaire's story of the White Bull, which is about the story. Uh, it's based on the story of Europa and the White Bull is is Zeus. So I was going to mention Europa and Zeus because Europa specifically is, I think, where George got the name Euron because Euron has a moon face and is mm -hmm. night and ice as uh, associated. And Europa is literally a frozen moon made of ice. And I think that George yeah. is using Io and Europa as ice and fire moon templates because they're both moon goddesses that come from Greek mythology. And Io is, is a volcanic moon to Europa's ice moon. And they're also two of the first uh, moons in the solar system that were discovered and are thus have a certain amount of fame in pop culture, Io and Europa. So, yes, I do think um, Europa is is meant to be invoked here. It's, a, it's again, a lunar sacrifice, a, a the bull is going to be a lunar, the, um, no, not necessarily. Sometimes the bull can be a solar symbol, but usually cows are lunar because even the bull's horns look very like a lunar crescent. And in Egypt, certainly that was the case. So yeah, this sacrificed, and obviously a white bull, the moon is white. So that's giving you sacrificed moon symbolism along with the, the Mithra sacrificed bull. Now, who's the king that falls in love with his dream version of reality? rather than what actually happened. Well, it's kind of both Robert and Rhaegar, isn't it? Um, Rhaegar thought he was saving the world, and kind of was, because they, they made John, but he had, he had his eyes on prophecy so much that he took his eye off the ball of replacing his father and preventing a rebellion from happening in the kingdom, which seems to be something he was working on. So there's that. And then Robert obviously is we just were reading about how he has his eyes closed and his ears shut to what's actually going on. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty relevant commentary on all the Kings in the story. Um, yeah. So, and then of course, Zeus um, abducts Europa and, and Rhaegar abducts Lyanna. So there's a, there's a parallel there, even though we know it wasn't probably really an abduction. So, a shout out to the nasty PayPal that I got from somebody who I'm probably not going to answer because I've already addressed my Leanna take and don't feel the need to defend it again because it's right. Um, Mark <laughs> Immerman said, George writes character chapters entirely concentrating on one at a time, regardless of chapter number. So he gets in their head. That is true. He does write a whole chunk of a character's chapters in one run. Oh, thanks, Carsnark. I'll grab that in a second. Um, this explains the exact continuation from 9 to 10. Yeah, Eddard 9 to 10. It also explains the delays of the Miranese Knot. He was mostly shuffling chapter order around so it would chronologically make sense. Oh, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that fits. But it's cool that he's able to adjust the beginning and endings this way as well. Unrelated. I would offer $50,000 for the five-year gap chapters. Well, if you got the <laughs> money, Mark... I'd love to hear him too. And a Miss Super <laughs> Chat from Sri Lankan Living Abroad. What do you think of the Rugby World Cup? No idea. No idea. Um, I watched a little bit of 
uh, Aussie football when I was over there, but not rugby as much. Let's see here. Yes. What could they be thinking, or Ned, uh, to not discuss that they were both there for her well-being unless there were... Okay, so talk is raising, okay, the issue of maybe they weren't there to protect Leanna. Maybe they were only there to protect John, and they were essentially preventing Leanna from getting help, medical help, because it would have ruined the secret and that's why Ned had to fight his way through them because they were only prioritizing John whereas Ned is prioritizing Leanna that could be but I would think Rhaegar would leave orders for the Kingsguard that would include Leanna that's one of the biggest mysteries is what the Kingsguard thought they were doing here at this tower well, that just reminded me of House of the Dragon Viserys choosing to try and save the life of his son over his wife kind of echoes that a little bit if they're there more for John than Leanna. If a decision is made that Leanna is having a hard time birthing John and it's going to be like one or the other, what's the decision What's the decision that's made? Because Leanna laying in her, laying in her own, in that bed of blood, it sounds like they might have performed a rough C-section to get John out of there. Maybe. There are C-section theories. Um, and then the other option is just that there's something complicated with the birth and she's she's bleeding out um that's the mm. standard uh interpretation but yeah the blood could also come from something like what we saw in house of the dragon i hope not really hope not hasn't they can't have suffered enough <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> all right mostly from the people on twitter trying to rob her of her agency tim don't know why people <laughs> would do that as if they're protecting a fictional character with their tweets, Tim. Tweets don't protect anyone, fictional or real. And you can't protect yeah. fictional characters because they're not real. Just... Yeah. Him. Yeah. yeah. Him <laughs> Just throwing it out there. Birth. I guess him... like Yeah, because Viserys chooses the baby of his own wife. But if, if this is a similar situation, it's how far is Rhaegar willing to go to see his prophecy through is the third child more important than the mother in this sense even though it's not the third child he was expecting because he was expecting a second daughter yeah that could be you know if it comes to it you know prioritize the one or the other um maybe leanna wasn't supposed to walk away from the tower of the joy to keep the secret uh, that would be messed up though it turns Rhaegar into a psychopathic murderer i have a problem yeah. with that generally <clears throat> all right let's see here There's a typo in Tim's handle in the description. Oh. Well, I will make sure to fix that. So that Is it can... my Twitter or my YouTube? Because no, my it's YouTube... on the description of the video, Tim. Uh, okay. the, the, I'm using the at YouTube handle. I, I'll fix it after the stream. Thank you very much, Free Gum Fighter. That was nice of you. Appreciate that. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Matt Diff, I wonder if they would go so far as to purposely kill as many people besides Ned, including themselves. They might think they can depend on Ned to protect his blood and less witnesses is a better chance. Yeah, there is also some possibilities where they make an agreement and then Arthur Dane is committing ritual suicide. The Kingsguard are stubborn enough to consider that the only honorable out. Like, oh, if our king is dead, we can't serve our enemies. We have to die. Like... After we've yeah, carried that's out our like, last order, it mimics the Blood Riders, kind of, right? Uh, that's what I was just about to say, uh, the Blood Riders. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, you said it already. I was going to uh, say the Blood. I was going to say the Blood Riders. <laughs> uh, okay, so another super chat there. I, as usual, Kirsty is is packing a whole theory into one sentence, and I cannot understand what she's talking about. Peter's brothel plus and Ned's pro prostitutes ban, ban refer to Ishtar. I think I understand what she's talking about. 
Um, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm, I, I almost get it. There's something about, I see, I don't know anything about sacred sex ritual temples having to do with any goddesses or how true any of that is. Uh, so I can't really speak on that. I'm not sure if that's being invoked, but it is possible. I do think George is doing something symbolic with the sex work and the brothel stuff. I don't, I don't know, Kirsty. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, I just, yeah, I, it broke my brain. Let me recover. So where were we? Um, we, swore we swore a vow, explained Sir Gerald. Right. Ned's wraiths moved up beside him with shadow swords in hand. They were seven against three. And that echoes the line we just saw. They were three against 20 from the previous chapter. Same, same wording. Um, and of course, the Lannisters were the uh, phantoms in that one. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, it almost seems like, oh, this is interest. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, think about Weathertop, Lord of the Rings. You can only on the in the physical world, the Nazgul are shadows, black shadows. But when you go into the spirit world, you see their actual, des you know, desiccated bodies and faces and stuff. Maybe that's the idea here. Is in the fight out in the physical world, the others are represented by these phantoms. Okay. Then, last hero and his men die. They go into the weirwood net. They are now phantoms. They're wraiths. They're gray wraiths in the mist, wandering around. But now we meet the others and we can see their faces. So maybe inside the weirwood net, the others will look different. Maybe we'll see like their idea, something closer to their true nature. Maybe they'll look like old ones, Tim, like stag boys. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, because when we're given a, correct me if I'm wrong, but like when we're given a description of the others, they all seem to be like pretty uniform, right? Like doesn't seem, like the show went away of differentiating them, even though they made them by zombies. But the sense you get from the books is that they kind of all seem like they're clones of one another. Doesn't, or... I'm not sure if they ever really gave a, like a facial feature description of the others in the books to to like distinguish them from one another. No, they're twins. The twins to the first, nameless, faceless. Like it's emphasized how they are. Like yeah. that's why we think they're a hive mind. Yeah. So that's why I never thought about a you know an individual identity for the others. But maybe it just mm. means that we'll see their true nature, not necessarily their names or individual individuality, but their true yeah. nature. I think that's what's uh, that's going got, on. Sorry, that's, that's got my brain a reel in because earlier today I read uh, Shadows on the Moonlight, which is a Conan tale, and there's something very similar in that, but that's going a whole other way. <laughs> so that, I, I, we, we got to get back on track. <laughs> uh, Theory of Ice and Fire is adding on to my Arthur Dane as a, as a symbol of a knight's King Arthur, a, king, a knight king King Arthur. Um, in Winter King, Arthur is a bastard of Uther Pendragon, and he and his knights dress in steel for the first time that shines white in the moonlight. And Fayfire mentioned that, but I missed it last week. Cool. <clears throat> Interesting. Okay. So, Ned's rates move up beside him, and now it begins. Oh, yeah, that's your line. And now it begins, said Sir Arthur Dane, the sword of the morning. He unsheathed Dawn and held it with both hands. The blade was pale as milk glass, alive with light. No, Ned said with sadness in his voice. Now it ends. As they came together in a rush of steel and shadow, he could hear Leanna screaming. Eddard, she called. A storm of rose petals blew across a blood-streaked sky as blue as the eyes of death. That's one of my favorite poetic lines. It, it works in so many ways. A storm of rose petals blew across a blood-streaked sky as blue as the eyes of death. So the blue petals blew. 
That's fun. A storm of rose petals blue, which is what they are, across a blood-streaked sky as blue as the eyes of death. Now, the blue eyes of death are obviously the eyes of the others, but it makes you wonder, uh, the blood-streaked sky, that's more of the red rain meteor symbolism. So George is managing to paint a storm of blood in the sky as well as the eyes of the others. So it's the long night, there's meteors happening, the others are watching, and, the, and, and we've got the last hero fighting here against this original form of the others and the Night's King. It's pretty sick, okay? Then it says, Lord Eddard, Leanna called again. I promise, he whispered. Leah, I promise. Lord Eddard, a man echoed from the dark. Groaning, Eddard Stark opened his eyes. Moonlight streamed through the tall windows of the Tower of the Hand. Lord Eddard, a shadow stood over the bed. How long? The sheets were tangled, his legs splintered and plastered. A dull throb of pain shot up his side. Six days and seven nights. The voice was vague in pools. I guess I should let you do some voices. The steward held a cup to Ned's lips. Drink, my lord. Okay, so I want to point out something really cool here. This is the first thing I caught about this chapter linking. So Leanna's voice turns into the voice of Vay and Poole. What is the sigil of House Poole? Looking at you, Tim. Uh, I feel like I'm going to quit. It's a... I think it's like a blue, a blue disc or like a blue moon. It's like a, yeah, a blue disc. So it's a pool it's ostensibly, but it could be a blue moon. Yes. And so it makes us think of the ice lake from which the others are born and all the ice lake symbolism of Dante's Lucifer and the others being trapped in the ice, frozen in the weirwood net, et cetera, et cetera, stuck on the north side of the wall, all the same thing. That's why the others' voices like the cracking of the ice on a winter lake. And it's like you see about the frozen lakes uh, where Stannis is. There's the trees are like, the weirwood trees are like fi a giant's fist punching up out of the lake. So it just shows you the others are trying to escape. They've, the weirwood is part of their prison or part of their escape. Okay, so... Um, Vay and Pool. Okay. So Lyanna is a Night's Queen symbol. And we just read the chapter where poor Jane Poole, also a knight's queen, in her wedding to Ramsay, right? So mm -hmm. here, Leanna's voice turns into Vay and Poole. So you see, it's, it's, it's sort of helping you see the link here. Like the voice in the dream was knight's queen's voice. And here we have somebody that comes from a house of knight's queen symbolism, who's now a, a steward. So, what does the name Vayan mean? What is that implying? Well, let's see. Vayan. Uh, uh, the word oh. Vayne's derived from the Middle English words fain, or which all mean glad. The name was a nickname for a happy or good-natured person. And he does seem to be a good-natured person. That doesn't really help us, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the name Vayan. It... No, no, no. Never mind. Skill researcher mysterious. It's a boy name in a different language, perhaps. Huh. Well, sorry, that one didn't really lead anywhere. Nevertheless, it's kind of like, I guess the point is like, Ned is coming out of the pool, right? Like he was just battling. If he's in the weirwood net, it was a cold part of the weirwood net because he made it all the way to wherever Night's Queen is being kept with her babies that's being defended by the others. Basically, this is a Heart of Winter symbol. And remember, 
there's a curtain of light, the aurora borealis, that is around the heart of winter. Bran has to peer through the curtain of light to see the terrifying heart of winter. That's it's mimicked here with the Kingsguard. They are the curtain of light. And again, the aurora borealis means dawn of the north. And so here we have the curtain of light Kingsguard literally holding dawn. So it's a very direct representation of the aurora borealis, which guards the North Pole, and thus the Tower of Joy with its Night's Queen is representing the heart of winter, which you might only be able to reach through the Weirwood Net or maybe through being resurrected. See, that's the other thing. If Ned's not in the dream realm here, Tim, then he has been Weirwood resurrected and he's journeying north into the frozen lands, which is part of the last hero story. So it's one or the other. It's very similar. He's going into the lands of the dead, the frozen lands of the dead to confront the others. So that's either in the Weirwood Net or that's in the heart of winter or like partly both, right? Okay. And so he's reemerging from all of this and who's waking him up? It's Vay and Poole, the steward. So it's like he's coming out of the icy pool. He was just visiting Leanna inside the icy pool, and now he's coming out of it. And this steward is here. So there you go. I think that's what I'm trying to say. But he says it's not, he said, what, what, and how long was he out for? Six days and seven nights. That's 13. 13 nights. <laughs> because during the long night, the days were dark too. But it's, it's 13, yeah, so 13 nights. That's the last hero plus his 12. <clears throat> okay, so he says, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what is it? Oh, only water. Mr. Pycelle said you would be thirsty. And from now on, you can do the other lines, Tim. Ned drank. His lips were parched and cracked. The water tasted as sweet as honey. Ah, more weirwood paste. Which is like honey also. Go ahead. The king left orders, Vayne Poole told him when the cup was empty. He would speak with you, my lord. On the morrow, I was somebody was calling it the poppy net, and I was just processing that. <laughs> yeah, different. Chasing the dragon. You chase the dragon in the poppy net. Um, let's see. On the morrow, Ned said, when I'm stronger. He could not face Robert now. The dream had left him weak as a kitten. My lord, Poole said, he commanded us to send you to him the moment you opened your eyes. The steward busied himself lighting a bedside candle. Ned cursed softly. Robert was never known for his patience. Tell him I'm too weak to come to him. If he wishes to speak with me, I should be pleased to receive him here. I hope you wake him from a sound sleep. And summon... He was about to say Jory when he remembered. Summon the captain of my guard. Alan stepped into the bedchamber a few moments after the steward had taken his leave. My lord. Poole tells me it has been six days, Ned said. I must know how things stand. The Kingslayer has fled the city, Alan told him. The talk is he's ridden back to Castley Rock to join his father. The story of how Lady Catelyn took the imp is on every lip. I have put on extra guards, if it please you. It does, Ned assured him. My daughters. They have been with you every day, my lord. Sansa prays quietly, but are you? He hesitated. She has not said a word since they brought you back. She is a fierce little thing, my lord. I have never seen such anger in a girl. <laughs> God bless Arya. <laughs> Whatever happens, said Ned, I want my daughters kept safe. I fear this is only the beginning. See, Ned's not totally naive. He knows when shit's turning bad. No harm will come to them, Lord Eddard, Alan said. I stake my life on that. Jory and the others. I gave them over to the Silent Sisters to be sent north to Winterfell. Jory would want to lie beside his grandfather. Hmm. It Hold on. Mm -hmm. interesting Jory and the others I sent them to the gave them to the Silent Sisters and sent to be sent north to Winterfell 
remember we talked about like the original green men that were sacrificed and became the others or last hero's companions or both were those the original kings of winter and are they in the crypts of winterfell so here we've got something about dead others being sent to winterfell i'm just saying um that's jumping out to me right now <clears throat> and um, oh yeah his father's bones were left at the tower of joy you're right Ah, oh, that's right it would have to it says it right here it would have to be his grandfather for jory's father was buried far to the south martin cassell had perished with the rest ned had pulled down the tower pulled the tower down afterward and used its bloody stones to build eight cairns upon the ridge. It was said that Rhaegar had named that place the Tower of Joy, but for Ned, it was a bitter memory. They had been seven against three, yet only two had lived to ride away. Eddard Stark himself and the little Cranog men, Halland Reed. He did not think it omened well that he should dream that dream again after so many years. You've done well, Alan. Ned was saying when Vay and Poole returned. The steward bowed low. His grace is without, my lord, and the queen with him. Ned pushed himself up higher, wincing, as his leg trembled with pain. He had not expected Cersei to come. It did not bode well that she had. Send them in and leave us. What we have to say should not go beyond these walls. Poole withdrew quietly. Yeah, and the bloody stones. Uh, let's go back. I skipped over that. It's classic moon meteor stuff. Um, you know, uh, the bloody cairns. What's that about? I mean, obviously, bloodstone emperor, bloodstones, those are meteors. Pulling down the Tower of Joy and turning it into little bloody stones. That's kind of like breaking the moon apart into stones. Building the cairns, though. Cairns are stone tombs. Is that like building the crypts? Is that what's, is the last hero building the crypts here? A mound of rough stones built as a memorial or landmark, typically on a hilltop or skyline. Winterfell is built on the hilltop, and the crypts are below. They're in the hill, though. Fell being a word for hill. Yeah. Yeah. Planted weirwoods or the crypts. Those are the, right. Those are the two ideas I'm thinking of. Rocks on a body. It sounds like the crypts, because, again, those are stone effigies and stone tombs. Uh, but the main thing is that they're covered in blood. There's blood sacrificed to make these cairns. So that that is sounds more like weird stuff. Yeah, it kind of sounds like Ned was trying to recreate the crypts as best he could for the area that he was in to bury them. Yeah, yeah. Those are my those are my guesses. Yeah, they are Barrow Mounds. Yeah, right. The Barrow Mounds. Oh, right, because the other, the others are the people of the mounds. Yeah, could have something to do with that. And the crypts are, yeah, they're more versions of the same thing. Barrows. Yeah, it's all crypt stuff. I'll have to, I'll have to think about it for a minute. See if this can get something more specific. Okay, so what we say should not go beyond these walls. Robert had taken time to dress. Actually, you go ahead and pick this up. He wore a black velvet doublet with the crown stag of Baratheon worked upon the breast in golden thread and a golden mantle with a cloak of black and gold squares. Oh, so he's a king in yellow right here. Uh, a flagon of wine was in his hand, his face already flushed from drink. Cersei Lannister entered behind him, a jeweled tiara in her hair. Your grace, Ned said, your pardons. I cannot rise. Do you want to do your Robert oh, voice? Oh, I suppose so. No matter, the king said gruffly. <laughs> Some wine from the arbor. A good vintage. A small cup, said Ned. 
My, I didn't, I didn't comprehend that I was setting myself up for Robert and Ned dialogue. Let me just Robert and hang on, guys. <laughs> let me give you some funky music. Just, just to hang, hang the on for a second. Okay, we'll be right back. What you got there, Tim? I just want since we're doing talking so much about race, the dr- name of the drink I have is zombies or people too. Well, they were. <laughs> they were at one point. No, no, we believe that there are there is a remnant of the original soul trapped, and that part of the resolution of the story will be allowing all these undead whites to return to the grave and their souls to have rest. It does seem that that is. The conclusion of Danny's uh, slave liberation arc in the magical sense, and check out Born to Burn the Others for that. But all right, so um, where were we? Oh yes, that's right. Ned talking to Robert. No matter, the king said gruffly. Some wine from the arbor, a good vintage. A small cup, Ned said. My head is still heavy from the milk of the poppy. A man in your place should count oh, himself oh. fortunate. That's oh, that's thirsty. <laughs> Mm, no, it's not. I'll take all the lines. Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. <laughs> I got to try and make myself sound haughty. Um, I can do a Cersei. Point, I count himself fortunate. Sorry, go ahead. I interrupted. I ru- I, no, no. Blah, 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 blah. I ruined it all. Go back. We need the pristine <laughs> Tim Cersei delivery. Start again. Okay, okay. A man in your place should count himself fortunate that his head is still on his shoulders, the queen declared. Call that passable. Quiet, woman! Robert snapped. He brought Ned a cup of wine. It's just so quintessentially Robert. Quiet, woman! It's like... uh, He brought Ned a cup of wine. Does the leg... It's like, that's the queen, dude. It's the political situation. (laughs) That's not how you manage... Does the leg still pain you? Some, Ned said. His head was swimming but it would not do to admit weakness in front of the queen. Pycelle swears it will heal clean, Robert frowned. I take it you know what Catelyn has done. I do. Ned took a small swallow of wine. My lady wife is blameless, your grace. All she did, she did at my command. I am not pleased, Ned, Robert grumbled. By what right? Do you dare lay hands on my blood? Cersei demanded. Who do you think you are? The hand of the king, Ned told her with icy courtesy. Charged by your own lord husband to keep the king's peace and enforce the king's justice. You were the hand, Cersei began. But now... Silence, the king roared. You asked him a question and he answered it. Cersei subsided, cold with anger. And Robert turned back to Ned. Keep the king's peace, you say. Is this how you keep my peace, Ned? Seven men are dead. Eight, the queen corrected. Traegar died this morning of the blow Lord Stark gave him. Uh, thinking about the numbers here real quick. So that's seven again. 
and the eighth. Uh, uh, okay, let's keep reading. Abductions on the king's road and drunken slaughter in my streets, the king said. I will not have it, Ned. Catelyn had good reasons for taking the imp. I said I will not have it. To hell with her reasons. You will command her to release the dwarf at once, and you will make your peace with Jamie. Three of my men were butchered before my eyes, because Jamie Lannister wished to chasten me. Am I to forget that? My brother was... My brother... Oh. That's Cersei again. <laughs> My brother was not the cause of this quarrel, Cersei told the king. Lord Stark was returning drunk from a brothel. His men attacked Jaime and his gods, even as his wife attacked Tyrion on the king's road. You know me better than that, Robert, Ned said. Ask Lord Baelish if you doubt me. He was there. I've talked to Littlefinger, Robert said. He claims he rode off to bring the gold cloaks before the fighting began, but he admits you were returning from some whorehouse. Some okay. whorehouse. Damn your eyes, Robert. I went there to look at your daughter. Her mother has named her Bera. She looks like that first girl you fathered when we were both boys together in the Vale. He watched the queen as he spoke. Her face was a mask, still and pale, betraying nothing. Robert flushed. Bara, he grumbled. Is that supposed to please me? Damn the girl. Thought she had more sense. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I mean, Ned calls it out, but... She cannot have been more than 15 and a whore. And you thought she had sense, Ned said, incredulous. His leg was beginning to pain him sorely. It was hard to keep his temper. The fool child is in love with you, Robert. The king glanced at Cersei. This is no fit subject for the queen's ears. <laughs> Her grace will have no liking for anything I have to say, Ned replied. I am told the Kingslayer has fled the city. Give me leave to bring him back to justice. Cleo is throwing a righteous tantrum right now. The king swirled the wine in his cup, brooding. He took a swallow. No, he said. I want no more of this. Jamie slew three of your men, and you five of his. Now it ends. Oh, that's Ned's words from the Tower of Joy. Now it ends. Is that your... Oh, is that your... Sorry. That's Ned. Is, yeah, it is Ned. Is that your notion of justice? Ned flared. If so, I am pleased that I am no longer your hand. Okay, now we're back to Cersei. But I do want to point out real quick, just before we go on, the ineptitude of Cersei showing right here because of this lot, like... Ned Stark's returning drunk from a brothel. It's like, if you're going to lie, you need to make the lie believable. Like, Ned Stark... I mean, I, I guess they're trying to say because he's coming back from Littlefingers, which is which would be a brothel, but she's trying to play it in the in the uh, light that Ned was out, like, getting drunk and whoremongering, which is not his character at all. It's It's not something anyone would really believe about Ned. No one with real sense, anyway. I So I interpret this as Cersei trying to essentially piss Ned off mm -hmm. in the situation. It's an obviously false accusation. Oh, Lord Stark was returning home drunk from a brothel. Like, she doesn't believe that. No one believes that. Um, but it's kind of a smear that she can throw out that Robert then has to officiate. Like, well, you were in a brothel. What was going on? It's like... <laughs> yeah, step right into it. So I think that's what she's doing is essentially sowing dissension and and trying to piss Ned off. Um because it's she doesn't obviously like you know. Cersei's smart. She knows people's nature. The whole reason they're terrified of Ned is because he is the just man that Varys talks about being the most terrifying thing. So, anyways, uh, so, no, the I'm queen, pleased that I'm no longer your hand. The queen looked to her husband. If any man had dared speak to a Targaryen as he has spoken to you. Do you take me for Ares? Robert interrupted. I took you for a king, 
Jamie and Tyrion are your own brothers. By the laws of marriage and the bonds we share, the Starks have driven off the one and seized the other. This man dishonors you with every breath he takes, and yet you stand there meekly, asking if his leg pains him and would he like some wine. Yeah, she's definitely trying to troll both of them and piss both of them off. Like these are, this is Cersei being as inflammatory as she could possibly be. There's no question. And not that, just to be clear, not that that justifies violence against women. Of course not. It does not. But politically speaking, Cersei is definitely trying to get under the skin of both Ned and Robert. That's a pretty good one, too. Like, this man dishonors you with every breath he takes, and yet you stand there meekly, asking him if his leg pains him, and would he like some wine? Like, it's it's good writing. It's good Cersei trolling. Uh, again, a, a, yet another style of trolling, right? We had the, the Jamie trolling, the Littlefinger trolling, and now here is the more classic instigation from Cersei. So, Robert's face was dark with anger. How many times must I tell you to hold your tongue, woman? Cersei's face Cersei's was a study. Oh. Cersei's face was a study in contempt. What a jape the gods have made of us too, she said. By all rights, you ought to be in skirts and me in mail. Purple with rage, the king lashed out, a vicious backhand blow to the side of the head. She stumbled against the table and fell hard, yet Cersei Lannister did not cry out. Her slender fingers brushed her cheek, where the pale, smooth skin was already reddening. On the morrow, the bruise would cover half her face. I shall wear I this shall as a badge wear. of honor. So, you kind of forget what a severe blow this is. Like, this is not really a slap, okay? A vicious backhand blow to the side of the head. Robert goes like 6'5 or something like that, guys. He's like a wrestler. He's huge. And he just backhanded this woman, sent her crashing into the table and into the floor. Like, no, it's not a pimp slap. Like, that, that is a full combat he, blow that he just like threw he, to Cersei. And it says the yeah. whole side of her face is going to be bruised. Like, it's some serious abuse. I just want to make this clear. Like, this is not a slap. This, and it's done, like, yeah, he, it built up. But, like, this isn't the first time this has happened, obviously. And the fact that she didn't even cry out. She was probably trying to make him do something like this to lower his status in this scene and, and to be able to control the situation, which is what she does, <clears throat> in a way. Um, you know, like, she knows that she can provoke Robert. So, because the thing is, Robert, by being abusive in front of other people, actually weakens himself. Um, and, it, you know, so there's a lot of dark psychology churning around in this scene. Um, but, yeah, the show definitely downplayed it. It's a very severe blow, you can see. And George wrote it that way for a reason. He could have made it a slap or a shove. Instead, it's, it's written this way. So you are actually describing a pimp slap. I'm sorry. I don't know what I, mean, I don't watch. He pimp slap movies. He sends her clear across the room with that slap. <laughs> like, yeah, so, and again, just Robert's size. He's, like, again, about six and a half feet tall. Anyways. And, and also, Robert, like, that's, needs to appreciate a good insult. Like, that's one of Cersei's classic insults. You ought to be in skirts and me in the mail. Like, that's one where you gotta be like, touche. Touche, you know. <laughs> Nice. That's nice. No, Robert, that's the thing. Like, Robert can't see the humor in that because for him to be emasculated is the worst insult that she can throw at him. And that's the response we get we get here. Like when we like when we throw like I know I know people don't like hearing toxic masculinity, but it's like, no, this is a prime example of it right here. She she calls into question his manhood, and this is his response to hit her clear across the room. Yeah, so, like I said, it's a pretty, um, we know Cersei was already rotten before this. Like, she pushed her 11-year-old friend down a well. Okay? So, in a mm -hmm. way, you could say these people, 
deserve each other or they're they're quite the pair. Like I said, there's a lot of really toxic psychology flowing both ways to unpack. Um, so here we see that the, this the, just they're they're enemies. They're basically enemies that are stuck in a marriage together. Uh, they hate each other in layers, layers of hate. <laughs> so the scene continues. Um, on let's see, I shall wear this as a badge of honor. She announced. Oh, that was your line, but you already read it. Wear it in silence or I'll honor you again, Robert vowed. He shouted for a guard. Sir Marin Trant stepped into the room, tall and somber. In his, um... Okay, why do we get these people? How do we... You know you're wasting money when you do this, right? I mean, thanks for the $5. We'll we'll gladly... More time to talk about violence against women and how it's bad and stuff, but... Yeah, yeah. That's not a joke. Obviously, there's there's a certain person who trolls that way with super chats every so often. Um, so anyway, there's always a couple. Um, where were we? Where were we? Marin Trant stepped into the room, tall and somber in his white armor. The queen is tired. See her to her bedchamber. The knight helped Cersei to her feet and led her out without a word. Uh, someone else in the chat pointed out that, um, you know, we don't know the full scope of Cersei's awfulness and evilness either. So this scene, when we first read it, comes across even worse. Like, she's obviously being a bitch in the scene or whatever, but, like, we don't know that she pushed her friend down a well. We don't know, like, we don't know a lot of stuff. We haven't been in her head yet. She's presented as an enemy, but, like... This is where we begin to see, like, oh, this is more complicated. Like, Robert's been abusing her, like, really badly. No wonder she hates him. No wonder she might be plotting against him. Yeah, so, uh, let's see, where were we? Robert reached for the flagon and refilled his cup. You see what she does to me, Ned. Oh, I was blame her, too. The king seated himself, cradling his wine cup. My loving wife, the mother of my children. The rage was gone from him now. In his eyes, Ned saw something sad and scared. And pathetic, we can, we can infer. I should not have hit her. That was not... That was not kingly. He stared down at his hands, as if he did not know what they were. I was always strong. No one could stand before me. No one. How do you fight someone if you can't hit them? Confused, the king shook his head. Rhaegar... Rhaegar won, damn him. I killed him, Ned. I drove the spike right through that black armor, into his black heart. And he died at my feet. They make up songs about it. Yet somehow, he still won. He has Lyanna now. And I have her. The king drained his cup. Your grace, Ned Stark said. We must talk. Robert pressed his fingertips against his temples. I am sick unto death of talk. On the morrow, I'm going to the king's wood to hunt. Whatever you have to say can wait until I return. If the gods are... Oh, if the gods are good, I shall not be here on your return. You commanded me to return to Winterfell, remember? Robert stood up, grasping one of the bedposts to steady himself. The gods are seldom good, Ned. Here, this is yours. He pulled the heavy silver hand clasp from a pocket in the lining of his cloak and tossed it on the bed. Like it or not, you are my hand, damn you. I forbid you to leave. Ned picked up the silver clasp. He was being given no choice, it seemed. His leg throbbed, and he felt as helpless as a child. So earlier he was weak as a kitten. Mm-hmm. Now he's helpless as a child. So those are both child of the four symbols. So I'd say that um, you know, the last hero is either part Child of the Forest, or he has been resurrected with Child of the Forest magic. And so he is a, a child in that sense. One or the other. Um, let's see. The Targaryen girl, the king groaned. Seven hells, don't start with her again. That's done. I'll hear no more of it. Why would you want me as your hand if you refuse to listen to my counsel? Why? Robert laughed. Why not? Someone has to rule this damnable kingdom? 
Put on the badge, Ned. It suits you. And if you ever throw it in my face again, I swear to you, I'll pin the damn thing on Jamie Lannister. And that's the chapter. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> so that's mostly dialogue stuff there. I didn't see a lot of symbolism happening, except for, um, well, yeah, so the last hero comes out of the weirwood net and he becomes the hand again, hand of the king. So it just means he's like a weirwood servant because the weirwood leaves are hands and the weirwood leaves are how the green seers talk. And the hand is, you know, speaks for the king. It's the king's voice. So that's that's the weirwood side of the hand symbolism. The hand of the king. The king is the green seer. And the bloody hands. What are the bloody hands? Those are like all the people who died. All the blood sacrifice that went into the weirwoods to facilitate this stuff. So, yeah, the last hero. He's hand of the king. He's a bloody hand person. Yeah, it's all it's all the same. He's a weirwood warrior. And now it seems like he's come back from his mission and it just seems like he's becoming the Lord of Winterfell, essentially. Like he built the cairns, which I think is building the crypts. And now he's restored to his position. I don't know. Seems like, yeah. The king is the weirwood, the hand is the green seer. I can see that. Talk Studios, do you think the hand is a skin changer? The hand does all these things with the king's body. Well, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying, is that the hand symbolism here, as applied to Ned, is implying that, yeah, it's he's got weirwood symbolism. He is a weirwood person. Now, yeah, he's doing all this thing with the king's body. Yeah, like I said, it just m mimics the relationship of the weirwood and the green seer. Yeah. Uh, someone's trying to get your attention about a missed super chat. Uh, Gerald Hightower is nicknamed the White Bull. Why? Could he possibly have had platinum white hair? We have no description for him. And Jorah thinks Daenerys looks like Lynesse Hightower. Yeah. Well, so obviously we're looking for descriptions of Hightowers to see if they have Valyrian looks like the Danes. Because we think they come from the Great Empire of the Dawn like the Danes. I'd never thought about this. That's a very good guess, actually. Allery Hightower has silver hair, and she's kind of middle-aged. She's youngish, which plenty of people get silver hair in middle age, so that's very non it's very non-committal. Um, Danny looking like Lynness is a better clue that the Hightowers might look Valerian. We just haven't seen any yeah. others. So yeah. yeah. George is George is leaving it ambiguous by making uh, Gerald Hightower in that kind of like 40, 50 age range because he would kind of have that going gray, silver fox type of look to but him. The, so um, the nickname yeah. is older. Presumably the nickname is because he joined the King's Guard. So he's the white bull. Because, But why the bull? Like what's... Hightower I thought it's because he's like man. big and brawny. Yeah, I guess he's just brawny, right? Yeah. He's jacked. <laughs> like, that's the way I always picture... Like, when I picture Gerald Hightower in my mind's eye, he's, like, built like a linebacker, you know? Yeah. What do you mean he looks like Corrin Halfhand? We don't know what either one of them look like. I mean, Corrin has a description. We have noticed... <laughs> he's just trolling me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm falling for it. It's late. I'm a little tired. The bull is cooler than an aurochs. Uh, Sri Lankan, what was the, what, what was the, just repeat your question so I can get it because they only let me scroll back so far. I was going to delete it. Yeah, Sri Lankan, uh, just repeat your question and I will answer it. And also if you, anyone else has questions, throw them out and we'll get those too. Yeah, that's another point of why would Corn be Gerald Hightower? Like, he's already dead, so what would be the whole point of that? 
But again, famous people like Arthur Dane and Gerald Hightower can't hide out on the wall at East Watch for years and expect no one to recognize them. That's not a good plan. You wouldn't do that. And it wouldn't work. You have to go to Essos if you want to play dead. Oh. So for Gerald being the white bull, that goes back to some of that Dionysus stuff we were talking about because Dionysus is a god of fertility and harvest and feasting and the high towers are a reach house, which is the bread basket of Westeros. So a white bull being sacrificed would be something that you would like, something you would probably see as a sacri uh, ritual sacrifice for a bountiful harvest for a like a harvest type god like Dionysus would be or Garth the Green would be looked upon as. Yeah, I get yeah, I get that. And that's kind of like the whole point of like the Mithras sacrificing the white bull. That's not coming from nowhere. That's like it's what mm -hmm. you do, you know, to you sacrifice a bull to the gods and then you get some some magic mana. It's a very old idea. It's probably very old. <laughs> Who's the elder brother at the Silent Isle? Um, is there a theory about who he is? I forget. Yes, there is a theory about who he is. But I thought it was a minor character. Not like... Not like a major character. But somebody can remind me. I do forget. Yeah, if you're watching, click like. Oh, I see Kelly Johnson. The show isn't playing into the high towers looking Valerian at all. A lost opportunity. No, Kelly, I understand why they didn't do that because there's already too many damn Valerians running around. It just would have been confusing. But the fact that um, in the original version, in a fire and blood version, the old King Jaehaerys mistakes young Alicent for one of his daughters which implies that Alicent in the books probably is very pale blonde and might have Valerian looks because why else would the king mistake him for his daughter or mistake her for his daughter? Now the show yeah. didn't go that way because it just would have been too confusing and I get that. And also they're not, the show's not planning on using the Great Empire of the Dawn theory so they don't, it's not important to them to set up the high towers yeah. as proto-Valerians. So yeah. Yeah, because that's that's one of the problems you run into in adaptation is also you need to make the show appeal to non book readers, which House of the Dragon is. It needs to appeal to people that have not read Fire and Blood. And if they're going to try and liken it back to Game of Thrones so that people who aren't book readers also have a point of reference, then setting up the High Towers is more like a Tyrell style family, which was what they seem to be doing by making Allison a brunette. I think they're trying to like point, make them more like like the Tyrells look, so that people have a reference point. So and yeah, that makes the, sense because they're another house. Totally, yeah. The, the, they're just yeah. All that that's what I told people. Like yeah, all that secret high tower stuff. The House of the Dragon's not going to use that. Um, so somebody's pointing out that the Cretan bull, the father of the Minotaur, is a white bull, and obviously the high tower under the high tower is a maze. Maze like tunnels in the Fused Stone Fortress. Okay. And we know George does use Minotaur symbolism at, Weir at Winterfell with the stone maze and all that stuff. So, yeah, um, that probably checks out Gerald Hightower as father of the Minotaur in a sense. Yeah. Oh, man, that would be a Minotaur. <laughs> But I wonder if that has anything to do with the Europa story. Uh, doesn't look like it. And then, of course, slaying the, slaying the monster in the maze, that sounds like going into the Weirwood Net to kill Night's King or something like that. Does it not? So I said Arthur Dane is like... A King Arthur version of Knight's King standing there at the Tower of Joy. So Gerald Hightower, possibly all three of these people symbolize the same figure. Maybe that's what it's supposed to be. Because, yeah, Hightower, he's, he's 
He's the father of the Minotaur and the Minotaur himself. Both. So that sounds like the monster that's in the maze. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, yes, the Nandi bull, uh, the Mount of uh, Shiva. Yes, uh, is also a white bull. And of course, that's probably from common Proto-Indo-European origin, but it's a different story. I would have to read this, the myth of the mythology about the Nandi bull. I've, I've forgotten it. Matt Diff, when I hear about the stone mazes, my mind goes to ice equals stone and the maze is a trap or prison. In the other words, side of the weirwood. Yeah, that, so the weirwood is maze-like and trap-like for everyone. Like Blood Raven is trapped. He's physically trapped. And the caves down there are like a maze. So he's trapped in a maze. Um, it's, it's all parallel. But yes, the, the others are definitely trapped in the frozen pond, which is like a prison. And we see that at White Harbor with Garth the Jailer and the Blackstone Prison, the Weirwood Prison. It's all the same language. Because um, remember, uh, Fish Garth is a prison for fish. It's a trap. It's called a fish trap. That's what a fish garth is. It's literally a trap for fish. So, um, where was I? The Minotaur, yes. So Theseus, he, aided by Ariadne and her red thread, is able to find his way through the maze and kill the monster, who's the brother of Ariadne, right? Isn't that correct, Tim? Oh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. Isn't actually, Ariadne I'm... related to the Minotaur? So, Cretan princess, daughter of King Minos, different variations of her myth, but she is known for helping Theseus escape the Minotaur and being abandoned by him on the island of Naxos. Half-brother. Yeah, that's what I thought, half-brother, someone in the chat is saying. Oh, and our old friend Dionysus pops up there again, too. He sees her sleeping, falls in love with her, marries her, and throws her jewel crown into the sky to create a constellation. So is Pasiphae also the mother of Ariadne? Yeah. Yeah. Same mother, Pasiphae. Yeah, that's it. Pasiphae nursed the Minotaur. So when we think of the uh, Perseus as the last hero sneaking into the maze to kill this monster, being held by a woman, that's obviously going to be the spirit of Night's Queen or Nissa Nissa in the Weirwood Net guiding the last hero, the original time. This time, the genders will be kind of flipped. Probably be Bran in the Weirwood Net guiding Danny and John uh, to go into the heart of winter physically. Uh, so I think, I think that all checks out. That all checks out. The gods force the king's wife to sleep with the white bull. Yeah. Cool, yeah. So there's there's it's definitely a symbolism party here at the Tower of Joy. And the other thing about the bat, because of it is a nocturnal animal, there's a basic symbolism to it that's not even culturally specific. Like bats are Creatures of the night, creatures of the underworld. They come out of caves, okay? So we can broadly interpret it, you know. I repeated my super chat below. Okay, cool. Let me look for it. I think you meant above, but let's find it. I always say repeat your super chat and then don't look at the chat. <laughs> Maybe he's about to repeat it. Yes. About the way Ned and Oberyn raised their daughters, it was a... Oh, that was what we talked about last stream. 
Uh, was it affected by their trauma about what happened to their sisters? Well, yeah, I mean, the, actually, Ned gives Arya a sword, which is kind of Oberyn like. Because remember, Lyanna was denied a sword by Rickard, but we figured out that Brandon snuck her sword practice anyway. And that's why she knew how to handle one uh, at the tourney of Harrenhal. So yeah, that did affect... But apart from giving Arya the sword, Ned mostly shelters his kits. Whereas Oberyn prepares them to be killers. So yeah, there, it's definitely... In a way, yes, I can see your point. Oberyn raised them to be too violent while Ned raised them to be too naive. Either way, both of them didn't prepare their daughters adequately to manage the world. Oh, I don't know. I think Oberyn raised them to be too violent. I guess. I mean, that's their culture, though. We'll see how effective the Sand Snakes are if they... If their lust for violence and poisoning and torture and vengeance um, forces them to do unwise things. I guess they are kind of ready to thrust Dorne into an unwise war. So, I mostly chalk that up to them being young. But, I see your point. I, I think the jury's out on Oberyn's parenting. Let's see how these Sand Snakes do in King's Landing. Mm -hmm. But you're probably right. And yes, George is always thinking about how generations react. Like Tywin Lannister is reacting to his dad. His dad was weak and dressed a, a whore up in uh, Joanna Lannister's, not jo Joanna. Um, what's the name of uh, Jamie's mom? Tywin's wife. It was Joanne. Joanna it was, Lannister. It was, no. Joanna's the, his sister. Lady Joanna Lannister was the wife of Tywin Lannister okay. and the mother I've, of Cersei Jaime and Tyrion. I've been wrong all day, Tim. So what's one more time? <laughs> she, um, after she died... Oh, and that's the wrong person. I'm thinking of the previous generation. So it would have been Tywin's mother. Yeah, Tywin's sister is Jenna Lannister. Jenna, okay. Gemma, yeah. Je no, Jenna. So Tywin's mother died young. And then Tywin's father started hanging out with a sex worker and let her dress in the clothing of his dead wife, which gravely offended Tywin. And he was a weak ruler and let people take his money and not pay him back and laugh about it in front of him and stuff. So Tywin is such a psychopathic hard ass in an overreaction to the weakness of his father. That's very obvious. And then we see Tywin's kids reacting in various dysfunctional ways to his abusive sociopathic parenting. Right? So George thinks a lot about the puppet strings and how the parenting affects the kids and how the kids then make decisions based on their trauma. Yes, it's definitely well encoded into the story. Jason ask, <clears throat> asking, what do you think of the theory that Gerald Hightower could be the father of Mage Mormont's children? Whoa, how, how would that happen? And any thoughts on why Jor went to the wall after the end of Robert's Rebellion? That I do not know. That's a good question. Why, Lord? Maybe, oh, to let his son take over, probably. But I don't, um, I don't know of any other I thought reason. it was... Jor Mormont goes as penance for Jorah running away. He takes it upon himself. That's why... Oh. That's right. And as for the father of Mage Mormont's children, I'm pretty sure it's Tormund Giant's pain because Tormund has that whole story yeah. about sleeping with a bear, which probably is slang for he slept with a Mormont woman. I think so, yes. I don't know Jill, how I've not heard that theory. I'll just say that. That's wild. That's some you use Peter Baelish's time travel machine. Not time travel. Teleporter. <laughs> Kyle father to bears. You rang. <laughs> uh 
Um, let's see. Oh, Barris Aurelius, thank you. I missed the obvious. Did the last hero dismantle the heart of winter in some way after defeating the others? Or maybe does he have to this time? Yes, Danny dismantles the House of the Undying too, which is a heart of winter symbol. Drogon burns the blue shadow heart. So yeah, it's Theory. time will come. Who comes? Theory is that all? Okay, so we've got Arthur Dane is Mance, Gerald Hightower is Corin, and now Tormund is Oswald. Who comes up with this stuff? That's terrible. Oh my God, Jorman, Tormund Giant Spain is very obviously his own character. Now, Ugh. I'm into the idea that Oswald went is actually Kettle Black, old man Kettle Black, Osmond, <laughs> whatever. Um, there's, I think I saw that theory once and it kind of made sense, but I don't remember it, and I can't think of why it would matter. But. Maybe it's a Tower of Joy piece that's in play somewhere. We don't know. Uh. <laughs> Wouldn't it make more sense if Tormund is Gerald Hightower? No. And remember, Jorah married oh. a Hightower. No. It makes more sense that Tormund is just Tormund. He's just a guy born north of the Wall. Because, like, everybody knows him. He doesn't have a weird story about how he showed... Like, Gerald Hightower is old. He has grown children. Tormund yeah. has, like, four adult sons. Yeah, that's... No. Look, look. Okay, okay, people. Like, there are tinfoil theories, right? And sometimes you come up with good ones. Those are the Reynolds rap quality. But then sometimes you get the dollar store junk. And this stuff with these three Kingsguard being guys that are at the wall or north of the wall, I just want to slap a dollar general sticker on all of them. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they're, they're discounted. They're at the dollar store, but it says 49 <laughs> cents on there. 29 cents. I know. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. Um, <laughs> Tormund is known. He doesn't have a weird origin story that suggests that he's secretly somebody else. And he's a very distinctive character. Yeah. Oh, Not yeah, a Damon, origin story. Yeah. Damon's right here. Damon's sleeping. But there you All go. Right, let me check my <laughs> mail here again. Yes, I, there is another super chat. I bet it's Kelly Johnson again. Yes, it is. House of the Dragon is trash. Down with it <laughs> and up with the Jon Snow spinoff. What's with all the trolling today? The Jon Snow spinoff is going to be pure fan fiction. It's not... <clears throat> I have put out my ideas about it. I think it could be interesting to explore the others and Night's Queen and stuff like that further. But again, it's going to be entirely incumbent upon whoever writes it to write a new good story. It's not going to tell us anything about the world of Ice and Fire, really. Probably. I mean, I guess. I don't know. Maybe George wants to put a bunch of canon in there, but... I don't know. House of the Dragon was pretty good. I don't really understand saying it's trash. It was either good or very good. I think that's the normal range of reviews on it. The only people that hate it are people that have weird, like, they're standing one character and they, they weren't, their enemies weren't made villainous enough for their liking or some bullshit like that. Which, in case you can't tell, I'm entirely done with tiptoeing around anybody's bullshit on this channel. It's not something I do. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Someone tried to hit me with the, um, so you're saying if a girl's mature for 14, you can kidnap her and fuck her and put a kid in her? Is that what you're saying, David Lightbringer? <laughs> I'm, that's not worthy of a response, right? Oh, no, no, okay. just keep the money, just keep the money, keep the money. <laughs> they wasted money to say that. Oh, yeah. And again, to make a serious point about this, the, where I started with the Leanna stream was don't center the conversation around Leanna of Leanna around Rhaegar. And that's exactly what this comment does. We're only talking about Le Re uh, Leanna 
in terms of, oh, was it okay for Rhaegar to do what he did? We weren't even talking about whether or not what Rhaegar did was okay or not. We don't have all the information. And this is a story where prophecy and magic are real. So if Rhaegar and Lyanna were believing in prophecy and that's why they did what they did, you can't really blame them or call them crazy because prophecy and magic are real, unlike in the real world. <clears throat> but the main thing is like, we had the Lyanna stream to talk about Lyanna as a character. It doesn't have anything to do with evaluating the morality of Rhaegar. Lyanna is just a character with agency who's written to have agency. And I think it's valid to compare her with somebody like the poor girl in the brothel who has no agency. And it's interesting to see and discuss the various degrees of agency because people can still... Um, there is an agency imbalance between Rhaegar and Lyanna. Rhaegar is older. He has prophetic knowledge that he is sharing with Lyanna that's sort of like impressing her possibly. He's the prince. She's the daughter of the Lord of Winterfell, so high status. But there's, there's still an agency gap. And it's also a patriarchal world. She's female. He's male. Okay? But also there's an agency gap relative. This is called complexity, by the way. Uh, between Lyanna and the girl in the brothel who has very little agency. So, uh, sorry, um, you know, some people have the minds of toddlers and lash out with very black or white thinking like that. And, you know, um, obviously, the David Lightbringer channel does not condone abducting 14-year-old girls. Needless to say, it's uh, so not one something uh, anyone should do. Don't try that out. So one question a lot of people have been repeating over and over is why does why is Ned Day named after Ned if he killed Arthur? Um, it would possibly have to do with the complexity of the way that Arthur died. I think the answer is more having to do with Ashara, and this leads me to believe that Ashara is alive and that Ned helped hide her. And that that is the big thing that he did for House Dane that they're thankful for. Um, what is your guess about that? That's the thing. I, I haven't actually come up with a satisfying answer to that. I find that to be one of the big mysteries of the story that we need to know more about Ned and whatever went down with him and Arthur Dane and Howland Reed on that day to get an appreci greater appreciation of why exactly the Danes one forgate forgave him and honored him in that way to name a kid afterwards because it does completely fly in the face of what you would think of if ned had killed arthur dane why would he be naming why would they be naming their child after them it makes no sense um do you think ned and arthur could have cooperated at the tower and lied about the fighting there absolutely we've talked about a few uh scenarios where maybe arthur committed suicide at the end of them hammering out an agreement. Um, mu again, much like a blood rider. Uh, that could absolutely be part of it. So Ned may not have killed Arthur, and the Danes may know that. Yes, good point. Uh, let me go back for this one. Oh, Do you think oh, oh. Go ahead. Sorry, I just had a thought. I just had no, a thought. Maybe, maybe naming Ned Dane Ned is not a compliment. Maybe it's an insult in the way that the Reigns and Tarbex, uh, it's the, I think it was the, the Reign named her daughter Rohan as a slight against the Lannister after Rohan Weber disappeared because there's the, there's the rumor that Gerald Lannister might have killed her. So may, maybe it's not a compliment. Maybe it's a slight. I, from the way Ned. that young Ned Dane talks about it, I don't think so. But that is an interesting idea, and I've never heard anyone say that. But you know what I mean? Like, Ned... Yeah. He makes it sound like he's respected. Um, I know, because I just know that one woman from the Reigns and Tarbeck story, from the Reigns of Casimir, she names a bunch of her kids after women that died after Gerald, like women and people that Lannisters that died and she does it as a complete insult. Okay. Well, we'll put a pin in that. Um, do you think Azor Ahai is last hero, Bloodstone Ember and Night's King combined? And that makes up the three to seven symbolism. Um, no, I don't, I don't think George will define it 
that clearly either. I, I think there may there's is either multiple flaming sword people that are that are Azor high group of people like a type of person, or it's father son family lineage stuff. And there's you know last at least two separate people in a last hero and a knight's king that fight. We know that. Um, but yeah, I I hate number symbolism. I I don't know. I don't think it's a clue about the archetypes because there's more. There's Great King and there's 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 a lot of archetypes. Is it living beyond the wall at least equal to living in Essos in terms of hiding? Um, the scene that clinches the Mance Arthur conspiracy for me is when Mance, as Lord of Bones, destroys John in the duel with a two handed sword. Um, so. I talked about this on Twitter. The reason why Mance Raider destroyed John with a sword. Two reasons. Three. One, Mance is a badass. And that just needs to be established. Like, this is the first time we've seen him sword fight. So we need to be shown that he's a badass. Two, John thinks he's fighting somebody much shorter than Mance. I.e., with shorter range. And when John is fighting, he doesn't understand how his foe can move the sword the way he is. So John is confused and is being deceived by an illusion. So that is an advantage. Also, tactically, he's think if he was fighting Mance, if he knew he was fighting Mance, he would fight differently than if he fought Lord of Bones. He would expect more technique. Um, and so the Lord of Bones using sword technique caught John off guard. Uh, and third, Mance is full of adrenaline and rage at that point. So I don't, I don't think he needs to be Corrin Halfhand or Arthur Dane or anything. Um, to explain that. And again, um, Mance Raider was at Eastwatch for years before he went north of the wall. Mm -hmm. And has an origin story where he was taken to the watch um, uh, from a, a, a woods witch or something. Uh, a, right? Like a, a woods witch helps somebody yeah, he deliver. Was raised, he was raised from a very young age. Yeah. So he's, he's been there since childhood. That's like Right. That's so a people have witnessed so it. How could he be how could he be Arthur Dane if he's been there if he's been at, living at the wall since he was a kid? Like the the Night's Watch raised him, essentially. Yeah, and I agree with the chat. Um age of consent is not a thing here. Um that's not that's a modern term. Like it, what we've seen is that uh, betrothals can happen at any time. Two and three year olds are betrothed. Um marriages typically aren't consummated until sixteen. We see that with Jaharis and Alisan. There's a couple instances of it being consummated before then, and George shows us that like bad things happen when that happens. So it's not really an age of consent. It's more of just a messy medieval world that is obviously problematic that women still have to function inside of and struggle against. Like just like any uh, period drama where the patriarchy, you know, the classic patriarchy is still in effect. The interest um, in a lot of the stories is how people struggle against that oppression and find avenues of self-expression and self-realization and happiness and justice uh, struggling against those things. So, And that's the thing I was pointing out about Leanna. is like, yeah, she's running off with Rhaegar. She's also running away from Robert, who she said would be unfaithful. So she's also making a choice. Like she's choosing one guy over another. And in a world where the women have that choice taken away from her, from them, we should see that as, again, agency, a sign that the character has taken their fate into their own hands instead of letting it be dictated to them by the patriarchy. So don't take, don't infantilize Leanna Stark and purely look at her story through the lens of Rhaegar bad man, you know, that just erases the character. So, yeah. Literally, fuck off, you who said that to me. Um, anyway, where were we? I'm sorry, that was mean. I love you all, but I just... No, I don't think it's okay. To... <laughs> so you're saying you think it's fine? <laughs> like, no, I'm trying to sell you cereal and personal transformation. <laughs> Mythology helps us become better people. We use the cereal to lure away the 14-year-olds to the towers. Like, what is this crap? Sorry. <clears throat> Hope you all get a kick out of this. Okay, so Sri Lankan. 
Could the last feudal stand of the King's Guard be a foreshadowing of some entities failing to listen to all reason and still being loyal to the others? Okay. That's interesting. Um, I like cats, so you hate dogs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's think about the, the, the sort of emotional quality of the King's Guard making this dead end or stand. What could that translate to in terms of magic? Um, is, is there some Knight's King figure inside the Weirwood Net that he wants to hold on to his power? Like, okay, that kind of makes sense. The solution for the others is they need to go back into the Weirwood Trees. If they're the evicted spirits of the Weirwood Net, evicted hive mind, the obvious solution that isn't killing them, which we're all expecting it's got to be more complex than just chopping them, right? They got to go back into the trees because Azor Ahai stole their tree home. So Azor Ahai as Knight's King has power. He controls the others and the undead. If the others go back to their tree homes, Knight's King Azor Ahai loses his power, doesn't he? So maybe he's the dead ender. Because again, that's Arthur Dane who refuses to bend the knee. And that's the clearest Knight King figure there. I mean, as for that, I'm not sure if it would be people being loyal to the others in that sense, like uh, still being loyal. Could the last field stand the King's Guard be a foreshadowing of someone who's failing to listen? Now that part, failing to listen to all reason, but not them being loyal to the others, but instead doing what Cersei did at the end of the show. I mean, as bad as season eight was, this still would be a Cersei move to pull where she does not contribute help to the law, to the fight in the North. That I could see happening where people still keep their own internal squabbles ahead of the greater good. Like that is something because that's something that comes across time and time again in the story is when you have a threat that requires the entire world to come together and put up and put off like these this this these petty squabbles, some people might not do it. And that might be like, no, I'm not going to work with them. I don't care if the world is coming to an end. I'm not working with that family. Like that, that's a thing I can see happening. Yeah, absolutely. Because if, if the heroic ideal is sacrificing your personal needs for the greater good, then obviously we're going to have people, the villains doing the opposite. So yeah, that makes yeah. perfect sense. That is good. That's nice. That's a nice job. Um, Cause I always say the themes, the, like the, the character conflict should mirror the magical conflict. So that's a very good insight there that the sort of stubborn recalcitrant Kingsguard kind of probably symbolizes Azor High refusing to give up hold on his power. Yeah. So we got to yeah. kill him and send the others back to the tree homes. That kind of makes sense. So Jason Subic, yeah, but- by the way, Jason, thanks for all your super chats. I do appreciate you. Why do you think Osha told Bran Mance wasn't born in the North. How did he know Robert was going to Winterfell before Ned did? Um, also, Mance's Dalla has the same name as Missing Serving Girl at Dragonstone. The last part I don't understand. Um, Usha told Bran Mance wasn't born in the North. I don't remember that. Um, he was raised at Castle Black. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about there. You'd have to pull that quote. Um, how long did, how did he know Robert? Well, because Robert took like three months to get there. You know, the word went to Winterfell. Was... Mance has intelligence in Winterfell. So as soon as Winterfell found out, Mance found out. And it took him a lot less time to get to Winterfell than it did Robert. Now, like the context of what Osha tells Bran is that he's not a free folk because he was raised by the wall. It's not that he wasn't born in the north. It's that he's not born of, in her eyes, he's not a true free folk because he was a member of the Night's Watch before, before uh, you know, go, going AWOL, essentially. Would there have been Bloodstone loyalists having a futile stand at the end of the first long night? Well... No, I don't know what you mean by Bloodstone loyalists. Um, you know, Great Empire of the Dawn seems to invade Westeros at Battle Isle, but Azor High 
goes into the weirwood net at some point, and then his loyalists are the others. So I don't. I mean, every bad king is going to have bad king, bad emperor, bad ruler. They are still going to have loyalists because there are people that are benefiting from their rule. Like, that's how Aegon IV still had support despite being such a crappy king because someone was living a cushy life under his rule, so they're still going to want to prop him up because of that. The same would happen with Bloodstone. He's going to have some lick spittles and some sycophants of his own that are going to want to hold him in power so that they can keep their positions. And I just want to say that Jordan Peterson is the last person anyone should learn mythology from. He does know a lot about mythology. And so you can be fooled into thinking that he is a smart man. He is not a smart man. He is an ideologically bankrupt man. Uh, and occasionally you might find an isolated clip of him talking about a myth that is right and correct in its little capsule. Uh, but it's not going to go further than that. And you're also going to get a lot of really terrible, terrible propaganda and the guy seems to be spiraling down. I mean, like, the last few years from him have been, like, pretty rough. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's other people that understand mythology better than Jordan Peterson. Like, um, probably, probably me, to be honest. Like, I don't have the encyclopedic knowledge of every mythology that someone that went to college for years and years like he does. But I think that I understand how myth works a lot better than him. That's for sure. And I would also... I mean more importantly, steer you to people like Joseph Campbell. So. Yeah. Ugh. Your perspective changes on people as time goes by. Like 15 years ago, I thought Elon Musk was a successful, smart person. Time has shown me otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a whole can of worms. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, I, I, maybe this actually is a good uh, place to bring this up. I am working towards an announcement here. I've not got it fully ready, but I'm definitely going to be leaving Twitter. Oh, fastest unsub I ever had. Oh, good. See you later. Oh, Jordan Peterson disciple. We just lost one, guys. I'm sorry. I shouldn't be nasty. I'm in a I mood. I love her being facetious. Mood. Yeah. Maybe. Probably not, though. Yeah, they could just be being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Well, I was being sarcastic, too. <laughs> uh, what were we saying um, what were you just saying Tim oh I said something about Musk and then you brought up something about leaving Twitter oh Twitter yeah 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 um, so I'm not leaving Twitter because Elon Musk is conservative I'm leaving Twitter for two reasons specifically well three reasons one Twitter's toxic hell site it encourages the worst behavior in everyone including myself um, most of the things that I have done in the last however many years that I kind of regret are tweets. Like it's like the one place in life where I mess up and consistently don't live up to my values like on Twitter, but big two bigger reasons. One um, it's come out that Elon Musk basically scuttled the internet of Ukraine when they wanted to attack the Russian fleet at anchor at the beginning of the war, which has led to thousands more deaths in Ukraine. So, Feel free to go and, and research that story and verify the accuracy to your own contentment, but that is the read that I got of it, and that is the general criticism that he is taking now. And there's a bigger problem there of private people being able to switch off the internet uh, for countries in the middle of conflicts, obviously, but that's probably beyond the scope of our program. But obviously, uh, helping... Russians kill more Ukrainians is not cool. And then there's the ADL tweet, Tim, not sure if you caught that one, uh, but uh, the American Defamation League is specifically associated with uh, fighting anti-Jewish uh, anti hate speech, anti-Semitism, anti right? Mm -hmm. And so Elon, who's always been very concerned with bots on Twitter that throw his polls off made a tweet basically saying that he's changing the rules of Twitter. So only verified users can vote in polls because the ADL has the woke mind virus and they can't trust the bots. And there's, you could spend an hour unpacking that statement. 
and the layers of veiled and not so veiled anti-Semitism therein. But using words like virus, okay, and mm. um, in association with people that are defend, you know, fighting anti-Semitism um, is a problem. And obviously, bots on the internet don't have any specific affiliation. They're used by all kinds of people. But for some reason, Elon thinks the bots are at the service of the ADL, who fights anti-Semitism. So that's um, a problem. So, and it's not even about how you feel about Israeli-American politics or the ADL in particular, because I understand the political criticisms from the left in Israel of the ADL. That is a separate topic. In terms of Elon's statement, he is singling out an organization that is known for fighting anti-Semitism and blaming them for internet bots and him having to change the rules. And that is only one bit of Elon Musk's cozying up to right-wing nationalism and shit. So that is why I am working on leaving Twitter. And I will be probably going on Blue Sky. I'm already on threads. And of course, we have our uh, Discord for those of you who support the program via PayPal's or uh, Patreon or the subscribe button. But yeah, it's, it's been brewing. It's people been leaving Twitter for a while. There's a lot of good reasons to leave Twitter, uh, but those are, those are my reasons. So I'm pretty big on Twitter. So this is a big thing. It's by far my biggest social media and I'm going to shut it down uh, because I don't want to contribute to what he's doing. So mm. there you go. And yes, uh, we're getting a little loose politics talk here at the end of the stream. Sometimes that happens. But we're pretty much done, so if you yeah. got bored and turned the video off 10 minutes ago, then it's so be it. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, like I said, definitely. Um, yeah, well, that's probably, I'm not going to go back into it. There you go. I've said enough controversial things. Nah, I think we're I think it's just last call for questions, and I think we're good then. <laughs> Tim's like, I gotta go I before we, you say something. We said last we call for questions like twenty minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I will like, um, I'll make a big announcement and tell you where to follow me and stuff like that. But I just want to leave Twitter so that more people leave Twitter and don't come there for my updates. So, yeah, and of course, a song of ice and fire is political, dude. I might start unleashing anything goes talk show streams. At any point, we can talk about politics, gender issues, all kinds of stuff. You watch out. I'll be offending people left and right. No, I won't. <laughs> I'll be trying to speak about these things with tact and love in my heart and not division. So we'll see how that goes. If my manager lets me do it. <laughs> <laughs> I threaten him every once in a while. I'm like, you're just going to see me going live. David Lightbringer, gender issues discussion. You can be like, wait a minute, I didn't know he was doing a stream today. <clears throat> yeah. Let's talk about 9-11. <laughs> All right, that's probably the end of the stream before this chat goes too crazy. <laughs> All right, guys, well, thanks for coming. Thanks for watching the uh, Tower of Joy stream. The comments should be real. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> click like if you liked it. <laughs> I see a couple of you downvoted it. So, yeah, guys, if you like what I said, then give me an up vote because I just earned about five downvotes for show. <laughs> <clears throat> Which is fine. Whatever. It's fine. It's okay. I'll, I'm strong. I'll make it through. So, um, the Ironborn video will be out Tuesday, guys. So, that'll be fun. Enjoy that. Um, um, I'm going to ignore that one. Okay. All right, guys. I'll see you later. And uh, go uh, subscribe to Gray Waste Tim's YouTube channel. Watch his videos. Thanks for watching my videos. Appreciate that. And uh, I'll see you on Tuesday with the Ironborn video.